just unmute if we just mute everyone Leah as well please <clears throat> oh I have to do myself Thank you. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At 9.31, I think we will get our planning meeting off to start. Thank you for attending our meeting this morning. Welcome to Broadland District Council planning meeting on Wednesday, the 9th of September, 2020, our virtual meeting. Thank you to all our officers who enable these virtual planning meetings to progress. Hopefully everything will run smoothly, but please be patient if we should find a few gremlins in the works, we will endeavor to resolve any problems as quickly as possible. Our meeting today will be recorded and the meeting will be live streamed for public viewing on YouTube. The recording of this meeting will also be available on the Broadland District Council website. You should be aware any comments made in this meeting will be recorded indefinitely. Please can I ask everyone in attendance to ensure that when your microphones are unmuted that you should try to keep the background noise to a minimum. Background noise can be very distracting from the discussion and information being relayed throughout the meeting. My name is Councillor Sue Lawn. I'm Chairman of the Planning Committee. I will now ask our officer, committee officer to proceed to a roll call for the other members of our Planning Committee. Thank you, Officer Matthews. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Adams. Here. Councillor Brennan. Here, can I declare that uh, item number one, or application number one, is in my ward? That's fine. We will come to the declaration of interest in just a moment, Nigel. Thank you. Um, Councillor Folger. Thank you, uh, Councillor Karimi Gouvenlou. Present, no declarations of interest. Thank you. Councillor Lorne? Present. Councillor Pratton? Present. Councillor Riley? Present. Councillor Ward? Present. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Officer Matthews. Also present with me today are Officers Tracy Lincoln, Development Manager for Broadland and South Norfolk District Councils, Nigel Harris, East Area Team Manager for Broadland and South Norfolk District Councils, and our presenting officer today. Lee Arthurton from De Democratic Services, who will be our host for today, and Dawn Matthews from Democratic Services will take and prepare the minutes of our meeting. Thank you. Just to make you aware, all members of the committee have received in advance paper copies of the agenda, presentation slides, and public written submissions, and any photographs that have been sent through for the applications we will be considering today. At various points throughout the meeting, for example, in relation to questions and comments, 
I will do a roll call member to member in alphabetical order requesting the committee committee's input. Today I'm pleased to confirm we will have public speaking for this planning meeting. Only members of the public who have registered to speak in accordance with the council scheme of public speaking will be able to address this committee. The time allocated is a maximum of five minutes per speaker per parish council. Please be aware there is no provision for members of the public to circulate documents or photographs at this meeting. The order of our meeting today will be as follows. The planning officer will present the key points for the applications to the committee for their consideration. This will be followed by questions to the presenting officer from members of the committee in relation to the presentation. Public speakers will then be invited to address the committee. This again will be followed by questions to the public speakers from the members of the committee. I must emphasize these questions will only be to clarify something the speaker has already said and not for the speaker to put further points across. The order of public speaking is parish town council first, followed by objectors and finally supporters, i.e. the applicant or the agent. Council members who are not members of this committee will then be invited to speak for the allocated time of a maximum of five minutes for each speaker. This again will be followed by questions from the members of the committee. Again, these questions will be to clarify something the speaker has said and not to invite the speaker to put further points across. The committee will then discuss and determine the application with the proposer and seconder for each of the applications. Members will give their vote to the proposal by roll call and our committee officer will relay the results of the votes to the meeting. Do we have any questions before we proceed? No, thank you. Okay, we will move on to our agenda. And at this point in our virtual meeting, I would like to bring items one, three, and four together. Agenda item one is to receive declarations of interest on procedural rule number eight. Agenda item three, to confirm the minutes of our previous meeting. And agenda item number four, any matters arising therefrom. Members, Officer Matthews shall call your name in alphabetical order. Please be advised if you have any declarations of interest and please confirm if you agree to the minutes of our meeting held on the 12th of August, 2020. And just before we start, if I can just uh, relay Officer Matthews that um, I'd like to declare an interest on behalf of all the committee members that we have received a material from one of our public speakers in the form of photographs. So if you could please go to the wrong corner, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Adams. Yeah, um, no declarations of interest in the minutes, so uh, I'll find. Thank you. Councillor Brennan. Uh, application number one is in my ward and the minutes are correct. Thank you. Councillor Folger. No, no items of uh, uh, interest. Um, and as far as minutes are concerned, I was uh, pleased to note that um, my comments regarding the aviation in, in the, at the previous meeting were recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Karimi Gouven Lee. No, no declarations of interest and minutes are correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lorne. So uh, I do have a declar declaration of interest that I attended um, the, uh, the town council meeting for application number two but I did not get involved in any of the discussion and I still have an open mind on that. The minutes of the meeting I uh, accept as a true record. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Prutton. Uh, no declarations of interest and the minutes are correct. Thank you, Councillor Riley. No declaration of interest and the minutes are a true record. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Chairman, I think Councillor Ward okay. is temp temporarily not with us. Um, we'll just need to keep an eye on that for the first item to make sure he actually is, has rejoined us for the first item. Otherwise, we'll need to um, ensure that he doesn't take part in that item. So we'll just keep okay. an eye on that. If we can just explain that Councillor Ward has already explained to us that he has a little bit of an emergency at home at the moment. So we um, have agreed that he would be acceptable to leave his uh, screen if, if necessary. And we'll... Matthews yeah, well, we'll just, um, sorry, we'll on. just confirm, Chairman, if he obviously doesn't, if he's not here for yeah. the whole of the discussion on that matter, he will not be permitted to vote on that particular yeah. item. I was, okay. just, I was just going to say. Sorry. <laughs> we're, we're both thinking on the same lines, so that's great. Thank you very much. 
Okay, and um, Officer Matthews, is there any uh, matters arising from the minutes? Nothing I'm aware of, Chairman. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. And we will move to agenda item number two. Apologies, Officer Matthews. Thank you, Chairman. I have apologies from Councillors Fisher and Moncur. Thank you. Okay, well, that takes us on to uh, agenda item number five, and it's the schedule of applications. And the first application we have today is application 2020-0345, Dawson Lane, Blowfield. Officer Arthurton, can I please confirm that we have all the members of the public speakers in for this application in attendance before we begin the presentation? Yes, sorry. That's lovely, thank you very much. Okay, and just for public information, if I can just explain the process of this section, how this section of the meeting will follow. The presentation will be presented by Officer Harris. Our officer will be showing the screen throughout the presentation. Members will also have this presentation information via hard copies. Committee members, please ensure you do not leave your screen at any time during the presentation, public speaking or discussion of application. If you should need to leave for any reason, please give the reason for leaving to the host through the chat and you will need to understand that you could be in a situation where you are unable to vote on the application under discussion at the time of your absence. Please be advised if a member should lose connection for a period of time, the meeting will be adjourned until the member reconnects. Please note a member will be given a period of five minutes to reconnect before the meeting will resume. And if the member has not reconnected in the timescale allowed, he or she will not have a vote on the application under consideration at the time of losing connection. Members, can I advise you that on conclusion of the presentation, I will ask for a roll call. If you have any questions in relation to this presentation, could I please request if you should have any further questions or comments after I've asked you in a roll call, would you please address these questions through chat as our host, Leo, will bring it to my attention. Officer Matthews, can I just ask, are we, are you happy for us to go with the presentation or should we give Councillor Ward a few minutes to come back before we, we actually start? Um, I, th I think, Chairman, bearing in mind the circumstances of Mr Ward's situation at the moment, it'd probably be best to proceed without him, but we'll, he may be able to rejoin us later on, in which case we can include him for the next application, but I suggest at the moment he's not included in this current application. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, um, Officer Harris, we will now proceed to the presentation. Thank you. Chairman, morning everyone. Can I just confirm that you can see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes, thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, just to begin with, and before I start the presentation, I just want to let you know that the case officer for the application, Helen Bowman, is, Helen Bowman is also present today. There are any technical issues that do require officer input that I cannot answer, then I will be asking Helen potentially to come into the uh, debate to advise members uh, if that's required. And again, before I start the presentation, I just need to clarify uh, a couple of matters. One is in relation to uh, comments that I had yesterday from Councillor Justine Thomas in relation to her comments as summarised on pages 19 to 21 of the agenda. I just need to make it known that these comments were made in relation to an earlier version of the surface water drainage scheme and as listed include representations from other residents and these should not have been attributed to Councillor Thomas. The sixth bullet, bullet point down on page 20 of the agenda is Councillor Thomas's final comment. The bullet points listed thereafter on pages 20 to 21 are other residents' comments at the time which Councillor Thomas appended to her comments for information. I would add that these comments also feature within the comments of other representations as summarised in paragraph 4.8, which runs from pages 23 to 32 of your agenda. I also need to correct uh, a typographical error if I can refer members to paragraph 5.14 on page 237 of the agenda. In the sixth line from the bottom, we state that the basin volume, this is the infiltration basin, is currently 
227 cubic metres. That should actually state 237 cubic metres. Apologies for that, um, but as I say, it should state 237 cubic metres. Can I, can I, sorry, can I just interrupt up there, Nigel? It's page 35, actually. I think you referred to page 35. To, yep, just so members yep. are absolutely sure where that where that is. Okay. Thank you. Um, just continuing with some uh, verbal presentation. So the application seeks to vary an existing 2009 planning permission for 12 dwellings, principally in relation to the surface water drainage strategy, but also including provision of solar panels, a new boundary wall, and to approve technical details in relation to roads and footways. The 2019 planning permission approved a closed drainage system, i.e. a new ditch into infiltration basin, but with a smaller drainage discharge rate. I should point out at this stage that the application type under consideration for variation of conditions is not uncommon and is used to make minor material amendments to planning permissions. That is, amendments whose scale and nature results in a development which is not substantially different from the one which has been approved. The application is before members for determination at the request of one of the local members and is requested by the, a cabinet member, the portfolio holder for planning. The development as approved by planning committee in November 2019 has commenced work on site with works including off-site footway provision, on-site infrastructure including roads and drainage, and off-site surface water drainage system, as well as the dwellings themselves. It is acknowledged that certain works have been carried out on site that cross over between the approved plans and those now under consideration, and these relate principally to the surface water drainage system. Subsequent to the grant of the 2019 planning permission, the extent of the new on-site road for adoption by Norfolk County Council as the Highway Authority under Section 38 of the Highways Act 1980 has increased. Section 38 is a post-planning permission process and related to this there is now a requirement for the highway to drain to a public sewer, the public sewer that would be adopted by Anglian Water. This has triggered a redesign of the approved surface water drainage system to allow the adoption of part of the system by AW, Anglian Water, and to account for the increased area of the road to be adopted by the Highway Authority. This has led to the change in the drainage strategy as now proposed, as well as responding to on-site investigations and practicalities, principally in relation to the culvert, which has now been installed. For clarity, I would point out but the, the report written before you is written on the basis of the final version of the drainage strategy, which, apart from the proposed enlarging of the infiltration basin, has been surveyed on site as built. And so the scheme as presented is based on accurate on site details. Now, going to move to the visual presentation. So, the next slide. Just to put the site in context, um, this is the, the hatched area, the dark hatched area you see here running east-west along Blowfield Corner Road is the extent of the existing settlement limits. You'd be aware from the planning history that this development was originally allowed on appeal. Uh, it subsequently uh, had a new planning permission in 2019, which train, changed the drainage strategy to a closed system, as I already indicated. This is the side area where the dwellings are located, gaining access from Dawson's Lane. Dawson's Lane is an existing or was an existing track uh, that extended from Blowfield Corner Road in a northerly direction and the land level sloped downwards, uh, serving a handful of other residential properties. Uh, and that track then extends dog legs round uh, and then heads back up in a northerly direction, linking with another highway to the north. Next slide, so just to put the site in context in terms of the aerial view. So the development side of the dwellings is located here. The red line you see extending off to the west is the uh, foul sewerage connection where it goes off to uh, an Anglian water foul sewer. The red area that you see on this side of the road on the east side of Dawson's Lane then extending down and then crossing over onto the west side again 
uh, is the side area in relation to the surface water drainage scheme. Just to identify a couple of properties as referred to in the report, um, this property located here is number 72 and 72A, Blowfield Corner Road, and then the property here where you will hear from uh, a speaker today is number 74, uh, Blowfield Corner Road. Next slide, this is the section 38 drawing which I'm putting in to show you the extent of the road uh, that's to be adopted by the highway authority and also drained into the uh, public sewer that angling water will adopt which then eventually discharges into the off-site surface water drainage system so that's an improvement of the road connection uh, of this element of dawson's lane so to give access uh, from Bowfield corner road and then leading into the development itself so that the site can be accessed via an adopted road with refuse collection vehicle and all service vehicles etc next slide um, a single slide that shows all of the surface water drainage system that's too large or too small scale um, to identify everything but we'll come on to uh, closer slides of that so this is at the southern end of the development we're looking at the area of the development itself the 12 dwellings and just to indicate that the road itself will take road water and lead through a highway drain to the Anglian water public sewer at this point here also draining into that Anglian water public sewer is the roof water from the development itself that goes into uh, that public sewer which discharges uh, at a maximum rate of 21.3 litres per second into the then privately managed uh, drainage system uh, that extends to the north um, and then eventually into the infiltration basin. I would add that uh, flows cannot exceed 21.3 litres per second because of a flow control device which angling water will be adopting and cannot be changed without agreement. Uh, if uh, ex any excess flows would go into a detention basin to the right hand side as you see here and then when flows reduce below 21.3 litres per second that water would then drain back into the system from the detention basin and then be released into the ditch system that then goes into the infiltration basin. This is a photo from Blowfield Corner Road, very taken very recently. The footway along the frontage has been upgraded. A new footway extension now connects with Blowfield Corner Road footways heading to the east to give links to bus stops, uh, the primary school and other services and facilities, etc. This is the element of Dawson's Lane that's been upgraded uh, to an adoptable road standard, as you can see. And a new boundary wall, which is referred to in the committee report, has been constructed on the boundary with the neighbouring property here, as you can see. This is the detention basin that I refer to. Uh, it's now greened up with vegetation, uh, and this will take exceedance flows uh, and store them until such time as the water can then drain back into uh, the ditch system. Uh, which will then go eventually lead down into the infiltration basin. Here we're further north along Dawson's Lane looking um, in a southerly direction back towards Blowfield Corner Road just to show you the location of the attenuation basin and the new ditch which has been dug and actually sits the other side of this raised bank that forms the eastern boundary of Dawson's Lane. This shows the extent of that new ditch which has been dug. Uh, so the public sewer, the angling water sewer will outfall uh, through a combination of the attenuate, a detention basin into the uh, new ditch system which has been dug and that will lead down to what's known as Headwall 3 which is an inlet to the culvert. That drain then goes under Dawson's Lane and then discharges into through an outlet into another ditch that then leads into the infiltration basin. 
this is that ditch as dug on the left, sorry, on the right hand side, the east side of uh, Dawson's Lane. So we're looking due north. And you can just make out at this point here where the cursor is showing, that's number 74, Lowfield Corner Road. Again, another close view of that ditch uh, on the east side of Dawson's Lane. Walking further down Dawson's Lane, again, you can see that uh, bank that's been reinstated on the uh, right hand side with the ditch the other side of that, and you've then got agricultural land further to the east of that. This is where the ditch meets the Colbert Inlet, known as Headwall 3. Uh, it's a concrete headwall, as you can see, with a grate um, to catch larger debris, like branches, etc., if they do fall into the ditch. Uh, that's capable of being lifted for maintenance, etc. We then pick up from that headwall three that you just saw that photo of. That leads into a culvert which goes under Dawson's Lane. It had to miss services, etc., and tree roots, uh, as detailed in the committee report. And that then outfalls to a new headwall that then picks up a new ditch which has been dug that then leads down to the infiltration basin. That infiltration basin is located outside of the area at risk of surface water flooding that's referred to in the report, and you can see the extent of on this slide. That basin as currently sized is 237 cubic meters, and it is proposed as part of the development to be enlarged by another 31 cubic meters to get a capacity of 200 and 68 cubic meters, so building in further resilience uh, into the drainage strategy. This is the headwall, this is the outlet from the culvert, concrete headwall that then leads into the ditch, which has been dug across the field. Uh, it starts to pick up sand as it then leads into the infiltration basin, which is then formed and has been dug in a sand seam that allows for infiltration. That is the basin as currently sized at uh, 237 cubic meters, and it will be enlarged on the left-hand side as you're looking on your screen here um, on the southern side. Next slide. Um, you'll note from the report that it does refer to a water course, a blind ditch uh, further to the north of the site. Just to put it in context, that ditch uh, is approximately in the location here and the infiltration basin sits over here. So it's separate from that uh, blind ditch, which is subject to the area at risk of surface water flooding. And there has been also some uh, concern expressed about a new entrance wall into the residential development uh, off the upgraded element of Dawson's Lane, but need to point out that that new wall did form part of the earlier planning permission in 2019. And then I'll leave you on that slide and just to uh, pick out some detailed comments uh, and conclusions in the presentation. Whilst it's noted that concerns have been raised regarding the developer seeking to vary the conditions, this is in direct response to matters arising through the development process. And as I stated at the beginning of my presentation, this is not uncommon situation and provides for an acceptable and reasonable way forward in order to achieve and deliver sustainable development. You have before you a very detailed report which sets out the key issues and assesses these. And in summary, the main consideration is whether the off-site surface water drainage strategy in its revised form can accommodate the development surface water at the proposed increase in discharge rate of a maximum of 21.3 litres per second, also making allowance for climate change. It is acknowledged that the surface water drainage system is a key concern of residents and the parish council amongst others, as it was when members determined the earlier application for 12 dwellings, including the closed surface water drainage system back in November 2019. It remains the case that the drainage strategy is complex, but achieves a satisfactory solution as it provides attenuated discharge into an area suitable for, the, for infiltration and which is outside of the area at risk of surface water flooding, 
and this is in accordance with policy and the requirements of the National Planning Policy Framework. The approved drainage scheme was over, over designed, so it had a larger capacity than was required for the original discharge rate. And it has been confirmed by Norfolk County Council uh, in its role as the lead local flood authority that the infiltration basin is designed to take the increased discharge rate that the revised surface water drainage strategy proposes, including the allowance for climate change in terms of peak rainfall intensity. Indeed, the scheme is designed with no reliance on the ditches, the culvert or the att attenuation basin to provide the required storage capacity. But these elements of the drainage system do provide uh, additional storage capacity, which is a benefit and it is proposed to build further resilience into the drainage scheme by enlarging the infiltration basin, as I said earlier, by a further 31 cubic metres, giving an overall size of 268 cubic metres. The surface water drainage system will in part be maintained by the Highway Authority in terms of the highway drains, Anglian Water in terms of the public sewer, with the remaining mitigating suds features being managed and maintained by a management company. A lot of work has gone into resolving the drainage issues associated with this development. To ensure that the proposal in its revised form does not exacerbate existing surface water flooding in the area. Officers have done everything required by policy and as required by the National Planning Policy Framework. And accordingly, it is considered that the revised surface water drainage strategy and a system as built uh, and with the enlarged basin is compliant with the National Planning Policy Framework and in accordance with Policy 1 in the Joint Core Strategy, Policy CSU 5 in the Development Management DPD and also Policy ENB 3 in the Blowfield Neighbourhood Plan. Other matters in relation to the current application are assessed in the report and are considered acceptable. I would also refer members to page 99 of the agenda, the supplementary schedule, where a further letter of representation uh, has been summarised together with the officer's response. That doesn't change anything in relation to the recommendation, which remains as one of approval, as set out on pages 40 and 41 of your agenda. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Officer Harris. Okay, if we can go to uh, the members for screen again, please, Leah. Okay, thank you. And uh, members, can I ask if there's anyone who has any questions for the officer in relation to the presentation? Okay, um, okay, we can go with Councillor Karimi, please. Nigel, um, can you just confirm, you said the part of the ditch is being responsible by highways, is that along Dawson's Lane? Uh, none of the ditch is the responsibility of the Highway Authority. Um, the Highway Authority will adopt uh, the drain that will sit beneath the road, so it's the highway drain that I'm just indicating in this length here of the road. Oh, sorry, Nigel, we can't see the screen anymore. We've sorry. Um, if, would you like Leah to share it? Yeah, we're back on. Let me... Back up. I'm just going to go to the larger scale drawing. <laughs> Apologies, I forgot that you're, you're sharing your own screen. Apologies. Yes. <laughs> so this is something new. <laughs> this isn't, <laughs> this isn't a ditch. This is pipe work um, that will sit under Dawson's Lane uh, and that's a pipe that then connects to the public sewer that Anglian Water will adopt. So that's not a, that's not a ditch, an open ditch, that's a pipe work that will sit below Dawson's Lane. Okay, so the new ditch along Dawson's Lane, who has responsibility for the maintaining of that ditch? That's the management company. So the house owners? Basically, yes. we'll have to pay for that. Well, they, they will, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nigel will bring us back to full screen again. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions from members? Councillor Brennan? 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just uh, might seem slightly obtuse question, Nigel, but can you tell me, if you know, the piece of road or track that's now being made up ready for adoption, does that fall in any way, shape or form either to the north or to the south, or would that be ostensibly level with Canberra? Let me get the photograph. I'll need to screen share. Come back on. I suspect that there is, from this crossover at this point here, that there is then a slight fall from the south, which is this area here, to the north. Uh, so disappearing, uh, that there will be a fall that then gets picked up by the drainage that's going into that new blacktopped road uh, as part of the Section 38 agreement. Um, so there will be probably a central fall, uh, a high point where it then falls to the right and to the left. There may be, in terms of crossfall, there may be also a slight fall from south to north. Um, I don't know if Helen uh, has any more detail to add in relation to my explanation. Thank you, Nigel. Um, the, the the top level isn't uh, the coat hasn't been put on the on the road yet, so there, there will be a slight camber so that the the water would would go to the side, the drains which are to the side. Um, there would be a, a you know it's it's not one hundred percent flat so there would there would be a small um um gradient change between the um, blowfield corner road and where, where the unadopted road is but it, it will be cambered out so that that would then filter into the drains to the side okay thank you okay thank you both thank you and if we come back to school screen please okay before we move to public speaking members do you have any further questions in relation to the presentation no, okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, thank you. That now brings us to our public speakers for this application. We don't have any representation from the parish council, so I would like to ask our first public speaker, Mrs. Moxon, to address the committee. Officer Arthurton, can you please unmute Mrs. Moxon? Hello, thank you. Hi, thank you, Mrs. Moxon. Can I just, uh, thank you for attending our meeting today, and I'd just like to confirm that you are aware that you have five minutes to address the committee. Unfortunately, we do not have a clock that we can share on the screen as that would block you from our, our team. So the officer, Arthurton, will advise you when you have one minute remaining. Is that acceptable to you? Yes. That's lovely, thank you very much. If I could please ask you to introduce yourself to the members and you will have five minutes starting from now. I'm Mary Moxon, I live on Dawson's Lane and I'm speaking for existing residents impacted by the off-site drainage strategy. I had six photos to show you today, but at 8.15 this morning, these were withdrawn. So please look at the photos in your pack. And if you need to ask me any questions at the end, please do so. Photo one showed the original lane with field development site to the left, behind a bank and remnants of a bit mixed hedge. Both are now removed. The applicant stated there was no formal field drainage. Surface water remained on the field. A material change in surface water drainage occurred when the drainage route from the development site came directly towards my property, crossing the lane. Photo two shows the highlights, local concerns about the drainage. At least annually, flooding occurs as a result of surface water from Blowfield Corner Road flowing down the lane due to highway drainage failings joining with additional flows to the east into a blind ditch. It affects lane access, particularly for number 76, and contributes to flooding events further along Blowfield Corner Road. Changes to the lane junction have removed this source of water. However, photo three shows water still following the old route. The source is now the new adoptable roadway in the site. We were informed that this will stop when the road surface is completed, but this will not be checked prior to first occupation. With just the enlargement of the infiltration pond to complete, the drainage strategy is already constructed to the specification. 
a huge discharge increase of up to 1,320% to 21.3 litres a second is now happening. A 37% longer installed culvert with a minimal fall of only five millimetres in every metre of its length is also there. On completion, all surface water from site and road will be direct, redirected towards my property at, behind Headwall 3. The Assistant Director of Planning stated in writing with the much deeper ditch, there is no longer a one in two year flood risk at Headwall 3. And paragraph 155 of the MPPF has been satisfied. There is no flood risk to existing property as a result of this new development. The lead local flood authority response is much less definitive. It should not flood at Headwall 3, and the flood risk calculations are only acceptable. They also add there's a need to ensure the maintenance schedule is upheld and the system build is to the agreed specification. Photograph 4, Headwall 3 is not built to specification. The culvert is on the concrete floor of the Headwall, so silt and clay lumps flow unimpeded directly into the culvert itself. It should be several centimetres clear of the floor, specified by you in 2019 to prevent this. Photo 5 shows the silt and debris building up at Headwall 3 after one summer storm, before the site's built out and with the system not operating at maximum discharge. This system is required to be sustainable for the lifetime of the development, CSU 5 of the DPD. The incorrect positioning of the culvert entrance together with a longer near horizontal culvert means there's a high risk of blockage between, between head walls three and four. Photo six showed the parts of the ditch walls already falling to the ditch floor before head wall three, but this is occurring throughout the strategy. The walls are already pitted and grooved with seven months weathering. The planning office state the system will stabilize when vegetation grows on the wall sides. After seven months, no, no evidence. The increased discharge rate and damage from maintenance workers in the ditch highlight the fragility of the steep clay wall sides, particularly when wet. Any dislodged clay particles and lumps are carried into the culvert with running water. The final infiltration pond is retaining some water for up to 24 hours. One minute, one minute remaining. After some rainfall event. With the amount of silt moving through the system, infiltration rates will decrease because the, the system is at, is at risk of failure with the sand becoming contaminated. While there's a detailed maintenance strategy, there is no mention of enforcement, so sustainability will be a major issue in the eyes of residents and the LLFA. The maximum discharge rate is now to be 14 times greater, and serious questions about system sustainability remain, particularly at Headwall 3. If you accept this variation and increase discharge rates, after already di directing new surface water flows towards existing property, at least ensure Headwall 3 is brought up to your specification and enforce the maintenance schedule as the LLFA advise. Uphold the protections afforded to existing property contained in the National Planning Pro Policy Framework to minimise increased flood risk for the lifetime of the development. Please ask questions of me if you need, if you haven't got those photos in front of you. They are very important to residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Moxon, and I can confirm that all the members attending the meeting this morning have your photographs in, in front of them. Now, we will I will just go to a roll call just to ask if any members have any questions in relation to your, um, your public speaking. And if we can start with Councillor Adams, please, do you have any questions for the public speaker? Uh, no, Madam Chairman, not at this time. Thank you, Councillor Beadle. Mr. Beadle's not with us, Chairman. Oh, apologies. I hadn't done a bit. Okay, uh, Councillor Brennan. No questions at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fulcher. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Karimi. I have no questions, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Proton. Uh, no current questions, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Riley. No questions, thank you. And Councillor Ward. Not here. And he's not here either, apologies. Okay, so, and I have no further questions either. Thank you very much, Mrs. Moxon, for your time this morning. It's very much appreciated. And uh, we will now move on to public speaker number two. 
Our second public speaker for today's application is Mr. Ian Douglas. And um, Officer Arthurson, could you please unmute Mr. Douglas? Um, there's uh, Nicholas Hooper, Hooper, Hooper as well, sorry, um, who's the drainage engineer for the applicant as well. Okay. If we can go with um, Mr. Douglas. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, can, I, can I just explain to you that uh, just the same as we just uh, explained to the first public speaker, <clears> that <throat> we don't have a, a clock that displays the time uh, for you. However, Officer Upton will advise you that you have one minute remaining. Is that acceptable to you? Yeah, <clears throat> thank, thank okay, you very much. Lovely. Thank you. If you could please introduce yourself and you will have five minutes starting from now. Yes, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Good, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I don't... Uh, sorry, my name is Ian Douglas. I'm uh, from Landpro. We are the planning agents um, <clears throat> on this application. Um, I, I certainly uh, don't expect to be taking my five minutes. I think I'm uh, really here to answer any questions of members. Um, and and I, as uh, Leah has mentioned, I have alongside me Nicholas Hooper, who's the drainage engineer. Um, who may, who will uh, like, who would like to say a few words and and, and certainly answer questions of, uh, of members if if they have any. Um, I think really just to reiterate the point that that officers have well made that the, the principle of the development is is, is established through previous consents. Um, the application itself um, deals with uh, delivery end matters associated with the development. Um, uh, and obviously the drainage aspect is, uh, has been, uh, is key here. Um, I, I, I think really, um, if there are any questions for, for, for myself and Nick going forward, then, then please do ask them, but I'd just like to okay. hand over to Nick now uh, to, to, have, uh, to see what he has to say in terms of the drainage okay. side of things. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as Ian said, I'm Nicholas Hooper from Rossi Long and the design engineer on the scheme. Um, so much as Ian said, I think what we principally want to do is just reiterate some of the things that Nigel has already said in his opening. Um, so obviously the, the key point here is that this application has been driven by the requirements of Norfolk County Council Highways, which Nigel has said. Uh, there is a rather complicated history to that and as Ian said, we're happy to answer questions if people want to know more about that and how we got to where we are. Okay. Um, there are also a lot of uh, technical objections or objections that, that reference technical issues. Uh, again, this, this is too short a time to go and explain these in full detail, but we're happy to answer any questions that councillors or officers may have or any clarifications that need to be made in respect to those uh, technical issues. Uh, we would like to reiterate that all of the information that has been submitted has been vetted by your consultant in the lead local flood authority and has been given a clean bill of health. Uh, there are several allegations of things, for instance, not meeting standards, which we would dispute uh, and we would highlight the evidence for this being that they have been vetted by your consultant in the lead local flood authority and being given a clean bill of health, as your officers have pointed out in the report. Um, there are several references to, to previous applications and differences between the previous application and this application. Again, there is a rather potty history of, of how we got to where we are, and there, there may be some issues that if councillors are still unsure of that we can clear up. And again, it, it will take a bit of time. Some of these issues are fairly complicated, but we're, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think the biggest thing I'd like to highlight is there's been lots of reference, uh, including twice by NIDAL, to discharge rates. We would like to point out that, as NIDAL said in his opening, the discharge from this scheme is to ground via the infiltration basin. So the discharge rate is actually the rate at which water is entering the ground from that facility. All of the other values, which in some cases have been referenced by all parties as discharge rates are in fact simply intermediate rates at various points within this self-contained system. One minute remaining. Again, we can clarify that uh, in more detail if, if people need that explaining more. Um, 
So ultimately, we feel that a lot of the objections have come from uh, some misunderstandings of some of these technical issues, which is understandable as they are fairly complicated. So I just reiterate again, we're happy to answer any questions if there are uh, any of the details of some of these technical issues, including the, the reason for some of these objections, if councillors feel that they need more clarification. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. And I will now move to uh, members, a uh, roll call to ask if there's any questions that they'd like to relay. But if I can just remind you, members, it is just literally in relation to the um, what we, we've just heard just now. Okay, and Councillor Adams. Uh, no questions, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brennan. No questions, thank you, Chair. Councillor Fulcher. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Protton. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Riley. So, sorry, Councillor Riley, you need to be unmuted. Excuse Thank me, Chair, you, you missed me. Apologies, I'll come right back to you. Thank Sorry. you, Chair. Yeah, I'm operating via my iPad, so it's unusual for me, so I'm struggling a bit with this device as usual. Um, yeah, the <clears throat> there's been it's a technical question actually. Uh, the there's been a comment that the culvert height um, and inlet um, as, as, is not to a standard um, that was specified by I think the comment was you, meaning um, the council, I believe. Um, can you shed um, uh, any light on that in, in terms of that height and the inlet? If, if you can please keep that to, to a minimum, it, 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 this is literally just for clarification. So if you can just answer the, the councillor's question, but keeping it to the information that is basically needed, just answer the question. Yeah, obviously the question was with regard to the comment made by the objector in terms of what was the standard. I can answer what I believe they're referring to, but obviously it was their objection. So as I understand it, the previous application had an offset between the invert level of the pipe and the skirt of the head wall. Uh, and I think by standard, they simply mean what was consented in the original application. The configuration okay. of the head wall was amended slightly, but this application is based on, on the details that are put Right. So. Okay. So we, we can come back to the officers for more clarification on that if, if necessary, Councillor Vice. Yeah, I will do, Chair, by the way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carini, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Ward is not with us either. Okay, I don't have any further questions. So that brings our public speaking to a close. Thank you. And um, we will now, members, um, I, oh, apologies. I have to read out a statement on behalf of Councillor Thomas on Fort Thompson. Unfortunately, she's not here today. And um, these, the words that I'm going to read now are Councillor Tom, Thomas's words, not mine. <coughs> My apologies, I cannot attend in person due to other commitments. I agree to speak at this meeting as this application has local objections and is objected to by Blowfield Parish Council which unfortunately could not get the councillor to speak in their, allotted, in their allotted slot. This is the 15th drainage strategy amended for this development. There have been a, few, a huge number of concerns expressed by different parties over the course of this scheme's lifetime, as it can be seen in the planning papers today. The site in question is located on the corner of Blowfield Corner Road in an area that has been rather notorious for flooding events and is also adjacent to another site for which October 2017 approval was granted for 36 dwellings about not 2.0 miles away, and that's doing from this proposed site. I'm sure you will all remember the flooding events of October 2019. In March 2020, homes in Blowfield Corner Road, around 0.2 miles from this development, were flooded, causing the thousands of thousands of pounds of damage. A flood investigation report by Norfolk County Council as the lead local flood authority determined that this was a freak event 
possibly a one in 40 years event caused by the huge amounts of rain. On Sunday the 16th of August 2020, at around 6.45 p.m., there was extremely heavy rain in the area. The rain lasted around 25 minutes, and by 7.15, the area outside the same homes were completely flooded. The road was covered, and the water was less than half a metre from the front door. I have seen the internal photos of one of the houses that was flooded, and also outside the property, a long blowfield corner road, which looked like a small river. In regards to this application, I would like to mention two points that I have already been that have already been put, raised. This system is supposed to be sustainable to last the lifetime of the development CSU5 of the DPD. Yet the residents' photos show the ditch walls collapsing before head wall three. I think the committee should satisfy itself that the comment made in the planning papers at 0532 there does not appear any significant stability issues with the bank which will stabilise further when the vegetation becomes established on it is a satisfactory response. I would also question the LLFA comment that it should not flood at head wall three. This is not a definitive opinion this, it, that it will not flood. And given that the October flooding was determined to be a one in 40 event, but the area flooded less than a year ago is vitally important for the committee to satisfy itself that the term should not meet the required standard of certainty would it have expected to see would not. The committee must balance the need to get this approved development completed with the need to protect other properties from flooding. Whilst there is no legal imperative to approve this application, there is a legal imperative to prevent flooding to existing properties. If the committee allows the scheme to go ahead, which will cause flooding to other properties, then it is not upholding planning legislation. It is surely breaching it. I have no doubt that the committee will do its best to make a decision appropriate in the context of all the evidence. However, I would strongly urge it to give appropriate weight as it sees fit to the evidence and the concerns of the people who actually live there and who will be the ones who suffer if the LLFA calculations are, as seen to be in March 2020, in fact wrong. Thank you for your time. Now that is a statement from Councillor Justin Thomas. Thank you. Okay, members, we will now go into discussion uh, in relation to the, the application in front of us. You will remain unmuted as a committee. And please can I ask if you would like to comment or ask questions of the officers, please register your request to do so in the chat and I will come to you in turn. After this discussion, the committee will then determine the decision of the application on the proposal and seconding of the application. And if necessary, during the discussion, Officer Lincoln and Officer Harris will be able to respond to your questions accordingly. So are all the committee members unmuted? Okay, thank you. And do we have any questions or any comments for the officers in relation to this discussion? Or have you got anything you'd like to say? Yes, Chair, and my chat box isn't working. So okay, I'm flagging so up. Riley. Thank you. Yeah, I'm coming back on the same question, Chair. Um, and, and, and also another one in relation to um, the officer. Um, so the technical issue there in terms of the height, et cetera, of, of, of the culvert um, entrance um, and the comments that was made from the objector in terms of that, I was wondering if, if um, Nigel or whoever there on the officer side could just, um, could just flush that, uh, flesh that out for us a bit. Plus also, um, picking up on the wall members' comments here, um, and I'm looking at the photographs as well, date the 18th and the 6th, uh, 2020, where you can clearly see um, water standing uh, down the road, down the lane there. Um, what if this is actually coping with the, the surface water, why would that be standing there on the, 20, on the 18th and the 6th? 2020 and if it's up to a standard it also includes flooding and the environment and environmental concerns as well for the future 
why would that be standing there and flooding out what it appears to be in, in the way it is on that road? Um, was there some kind of temporary blockage or something in the system? Okay, Councillor Harris, would you like to lead or Councillor Bowman? I'll, oh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll try and pick up on on the issues and then if Helen wants to, to come in at all, uh, because it's it's Helen as case officer that's mainly lived and breathed uh, the various iterations of this uh, surface water drainage scheme. I think in terms of Headwall 3, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Helen, but I believe the, the, the culvert height uh, is still above the base of the, the ditch. It's the fact that a concrete headwall has been put in that now means that there's an upstand between the base of the ditch uh, and the headwall itself. And that headwall then flows in level the, with the inlet into the culvert. So there is still uh, a height difference between the base of the ditch and the culvert. I don't know, Helen, if, can you clarify? Am I correct? I, I, th I think that... The this is a different scheme. So obviously the, when they put the culvert in and, and the ditch, the, the levels have all kind of changed from what was initially proposed. So what we are looking at is, is what's acceptable that's that's been built at the moment. Obviously that isn't quite the same as what was um, was agreed um, previously. There is a, there's a small area underneath. And when you looked at um, the photographs that Nigel showed, there was a small sort of kind of puddle that was holding some, some water, but generally it is at the bottom of the ditch. It, was proposed to be a bit higher up but obviously the ditch is now deeper so that that has been a, a variation but what we're looking at is what has actually been built and all the calculations have been redone and what has been um built in the system so th this isn't this is a new scheme and we're asking for approval on the new scheme thank you uh, Councillor Riley, does that answer your question well i've still got the second part of the question thank you chair um, yeah, and that is on the photographs we're seeing standing water. Um, so it's the system. I'm, I'm, I'm checking it. Well, basically, we've got uh, objectors here saying the system's not up to it. So I'm asking, why have we got standing water? Uh, what's the reasoning for that? Does Helen know? Was there a temporary blockage or something in the system? If I, if I just come back, I mean, um, one of the photos you've seen, Councillor Riley, uh, was standing water on Dawson's Lane. You've got to remember that beyond the extent of this system, Dawson's Lane is an unmade track uh, that flows and falls from south to north. So rainwater falling onto Dawson's Lane that isn't captured by the drainage system will still flow down Dawson's Lane to its low point. The drainage system is not operational yet. Uh, it doesn't have to be operational until prior to the first occupation of any dwelling. The report also indicates that uh, at the moment there's some raised ironmongery in terms of the road that's to be adopted because the wearing course, the final surface on that um, road hasn't been put down yet and that will then take the surface water from that falls on the road to be adopted into that drainage system that will then go into the ditch system and into the infiltration basin. So what you're seeing at the moment in terms of photographs is a system that's not operational. Uh, and also there will always be rainwater falling onto the unmade part of Dawson's Lane that will flow to the low point. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, um, Nigel, uh, because it was, a, it was a point needed clearing up actually. Um, okay. So I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Riley. And we will move on to Councillor Potton. Um, two questions from me. Uh, you, I'm a country girl, born and bred, uh, and I know what happens to ditches. They get overgrown, et cetera, et cetera. But you tell us that the um, maintenance of these ditches is, is, is in the hands of a management company. There are a lot of new ditches built across fields here. Um, I uh, wonder who actually manages the management company, who can invoke their, uh, if, if, if the ditches are causing concern, is this going to be able, have the residents got to fight their own corner or is this going to be fought for them on behalf with the parish council? That's my first question. And my second question is, and it was something that I picked up when Nigel did his report, he said that the water was coming off the roofs. Is there any chance to go into, uh, is it too late to uh, in, 
bring in some sort of rainwater harvesting system. So management company, harvesting system. My questions, thank you. Officer Harris. Um, I was going to say, just to take the second point first, Helen, I don't know if you're, you can indicate whether there are uh, rainwater, any rainwater harvesting devices like um, no, no, there isn't any rainwater harvesting. Um, it, it has been mentioned, but it's not part of this. It's not part of the scheme. Pity. Um, from from that. The point one, of the view. one comment I would make though is uh, any occupier or any purchaser of those properties can put in a rainwater harvesting device, like a water butt connected to a downpipe, which would actually see potentially uh, less water then going into the to the adopted system. Um, but it's not practiced throughout the whole of the development. I mean, the, the, the scheme is designed on the basis that there is no on-site rainwater attenuation through water butts. If that's an added, that would be an added extra that a purchaser can put in. But it's the, they've designed the system on the worst case scenario in that all roof water goes into that system and that system can accommodate it. In okay, terms, thank you. Sorry, in terms of the management company, uh, that's set up through the deeds uh, of sale from developer to purchaser, and that purchaser will also include a housing association. The management uh, that has to be carried out is a schedule of maintenance that will form a condition in the planning permission, which will be enforceable uh, against that management company by the district council, but obviously we would if there is an issue, we would uh, we would seek to work with them to try and uh, deal with any issues that arise purely through negotiation. But if we need okay. to take enforcement action, then we could. But there is there is uh, someone who is uh, to whom the management company is accountable. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I will move to Councillor Brennan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we Apologies for saying this, but we do seem to be spending an awful lot of time uh, dealing with, with the drainage. I'm just going back to the proposal, if I may, briefly. It's saying the proposal is variation of conditions two and three of 2019, 08, to amend surface water drainage strategy and boundary treatment, addition of solar panels and details under condition four of roads and footways. Well, the solar panels aren't going to make the slightest difference to what we're spending time on. Um, if we're talking about an amendment of surface water drainage, can I ask Nigel, does that imply that this is an improvement or, or, or a reduction? Of it? Yeah. Because what is it that we're really voting on? If it's being improved, surely it, it's clear cut. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris? What, what you're being asked to consider is a new drainage scheme for this development. Uh, and what the report sets out is that the new drainage system that's been designed uh, and in the majority as built uh, works, uh, is acceptable uh, and meets the requirements uh, of both your policies in the development plan, but also the uh, guidance in the national planning policy framework. Now, the key here is that it's a different scheme to the scheme which was approved by members in 2019. You approved the scheme in 2019, and that was a variation uh, of the original surface water drainage condition that the appeal inspector put on. What you're being asked to consider now, yes, is a new drainage strategy, uh, but what the report sets out and what we've um, been able to ascertain from the LLFA and through the drainage engineers and through testing it, uh, and through those calculations, which are actually based on the, the system as built, is that that system is acceptable and complies with your policies. And therefore, that's why we bring before you a recommendation that uh, is one of approval based on this new revised drainage strategy. Right. Okay. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, that, yeah, an honest answer, but it, can I just drill down? Is this an improvement on the original? Is it the same? capability it, of the original or is it a reduction? It's, it's a different strategy uh, so you cannot compare the two and say this is better than the than, than than the previous one. The previous one did the job that it had to do, this scheme does the job that it has to do and um, so you, you cannot compare the two schemes together, they are different strategies but both uh, are acceptable uh, and that's why the recommendation as I say is one of approval. 
I just jump in there as well, um, Councillor Lorne? I, just to reiterate what Nigel's saying, it's in terms of the other strategy may have been acceptable, whether or not this one is better or worse. This We've had to assess this drainage scheme on its merits in terms of the technical aspects, in terms of the process that we've followed. This scheme is acceptable in terms of those issues, which is why it's been recommended to you. So I think to, to compare the two is perhaps um, not the right, right approach. We have to consider this one on its merits and officers are recommending that based on the evidence that we've had available and, and, and the, the testing that we've carried out and the technical advice we've had from the lead local flood authority, this scheme is acceptable to, to your officers. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And if I can just uh, ask, so in, in relation to maintaining the, um, the, the drainage system, can you just confirm that the, the maintenance will be done on a fortnightly basis to ensure that there's no blockages as, as time goes on? In terms of Headwall 3, yes, the management and maintenance schedule was revised um, through the autumn period that it would be inspected uh, on a fortnightly basis rather than the original proposed monthly basis. So there is some betterment in that respect. And the capacity is, is more than adequate for, for the site as, as we know at the moment. Uh, yes, Councillor, I'll draw attention to paragraph 5.17 on page 36 of the report, um, where it indicates that the ditch is, as constructed, is now 980 millimetres deep, uh, and taking the 1 in 100 plus 40 percent climate change event, um, Standing water, if there is standing water in that ditch, would come to approximately 108 millimetres. So there would still be uh, a lot of capacity within that ditch before water uh, got to the top of the ditch. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, members, has anyone else got anything else that they would like to mention at this moment in time? No? Okay, um, I would like to just say, as a planning committee, we sit here with a, a good knowledge of um, many aspects of the planning system, but we do rely on various bodies such as environment agency, highways, and the lo local flood authority, uh, to name just a few, that will advise us on uh, what's um, not only correct, but also acceptable in, in, in situations. And this is one of those um, applications that we do rely on. Uh, for advice and reading through the paperwork that I've seen, I um, feel quite content that we have got the right development drainage system for this development and I would like to propose that we would go with the officer's recommendation. If um, Is there anyone else who would like to say anything? Uh, Chairman, I would, I would second that. Okay, thank you. So has anybody got any other comments to make before we go to the vote on this? Um, if I can just um, explain that it's been... Has anyone else anything to say? Lee, can you tell Lee, can you just tell me, has there been anyone else that I haven't noticed in the, the chat before we go to the vote? Um, no one okay. else has indicated. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So members, it has been proposed by myself and seconded by Councillor Fulcher that we should, as a committee, agree to the officer's recommendation to approve this application subject to the conditions as stated on page 40 and page 41 of your papers. And if I can ask Officer Matthews, if you could proceed to the roll call to vote in alphabetical order as to um, how they feel in relation to this application. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So if you could indicate if you are for or against the proposal. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Brennan. Councillor Folger. For. Councillor Karini Gouvenlou. For. Councillor Lorne. For. Councillor Pratton. For. Councillor Riley. For. And Councillor Ward, unfortunately, I can't come to you for your vote as you didn't, you weren't present for the whole of the debate. So based on that uh, result, Chairman, that's unanimous of those members eligible to vote. That's motion is carried. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this morning. And uh, we will now move to a five minute recess. And if I can ask the members to please be back uh, at your seats for 
uh, five minutes from now, um, 10.50. And uh, if you could please turn off your videos whilst you're not sitting at your desk, that would be really good. And we'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, we just wait for one councillor to return and we can get on with our second application. Chair, are you happy for me just to do a very quick roll call when we start again, just to, so we can confirm who is actually in attendance? I'll do that in just a moment. Just wait for Councillor Riley. And Councillor Riley, could you um, start your video, please? Thank you, Councillor Riley. And if you could do a roll call, please. Yep, thank you. Councillor Adams. Yeah, here. <laughs> Councillor Brennan. Present. Councillor Folger. Present. Councillor Creamy Gouvenlou. Present. Councillor Lorne. Present. Councillor Prutton. Present. Councillor Riley. Present. And Councillor Ward. Present. Thank you, Chairman. That concludes. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We will move on to application number two, two 2020. 0403 plot 10 and 10a Broadland Gate Business Park. And uh, can I just confirm if we have any members? Is Mark is with us? Mark Kim Beach is with us. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. And we will move on to Officer Harris for the presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, um, Councillor. Um, that's just Count um, Ben oh, Burgess so for the presentation. Officer, Officer Burgess, it's your, it's your call. It's, it's you, quite a way. Yeah, yeah, we, we've got similar size beards at the moment, so that, that's <laughs> fair enough. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, make sure we get that. I'll ask you. <laughs> Have we all got that? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Great stuff, thank you. <laughs> right, yeah, so this is plot 10 and 10A of Broadland Gate Business Park in POSIC. And the application is for a new police station building and the construction of associated ancillary buildings, hard standing, landscaping, new access and external works. It's actually contrary to the provisions of the development plan, which is why it's here today. And just to give you the full detail of what the application is looking to do, um, it's the road policing and safer neighbourhood teams, which are relocating from Acol and Sproulston police stations to the proposed new building. It's joining the existing teams uh, to create a centre of excellence for detective investigations, safeguarding, crime scene investigation and public protection services with the necessary modern equipment and facilities located strategically to serve both Norwich and the wider East Norfolk communities. And in total, 240 people will be employed at this new location. I'm going to take you through some slides that give you an idea of the location of the site and some photographs. So this just gives you the wider context of the scheme. You'll see the site there highlighted in red. If you can see my arrow or cursor there, you've got the A47, so the bypass running there to the south of the site. You've got the Broadland Northway running up from south to north. You've got the existing Broadland Business Park, and then you've got uh, the roads back into Thorpe and then into Norwich ultimately. Look in a bit more detail. This is the site and, and this is the location of it. This area within what I'd call, I'm going to refer to as the POSIC Junction, is the Broadland Gate Business Park, uh, approved under application 2008-1773 back in 2013. Uh, it has a road already going through it to service all the plots within here that joins onto Poppy Way at the north there and the roundabout that joins onto Broadland Way. This is the site. Um, and next to it is some residential properties. There's three properties there that I'll refer to as Heath Farm barn, Barns as we go along. Just wanted to draw members attention to the fact that this is actually sits in part of GT10, the allocation within the Growth Triangle Area Action Plan. The site is broadly in that location. And just to see that it, it sits to the south of, of residential properties that have either have 
planning approval or are close to having approval at the moment. This just gives you an idea in terms of that original outline approval that I referred to earlier of the sort of building heights that were intended to be as part of that development. You'll see this site sits within this red area uh, where it was envisaged that the building height would be up to a maximum of 20 metres in height. This building is, is half of that site and I have a plan that shows us all that that I'll come into in a few slides time. This site shows how the um, the promoters of the development of the Brawling Gate Business Bar have brought the site to the market. They've, they've split it up. Hopefully you can see these, these dotted lines into parcels to sell onto the market. And actually it's now proven very successful. Um, it's been a long time uh, coming applications on this site and development, but it, it really is starting to come to fruition. We already have an approval to the south of the site here for a uh, car showroom, Jaguar Land Rover. We have an application and approval in here for an engineering company, Pinnacle. We've got an application that will actually be coming to the next planning committee in this location for an electric vehicle charging station. And we have an application in here to the north, the residential properties that will follow this application at the committee today. This is the site. I wanted to show you this for two reasons. Well, three reasons, actually. One, to show you the location of the residential properties here. I wanted to show you that this oak tree is to be removed. The reason I do that is because it orientates us as we look at the photographs moving along, but also that it um, shows that this is a tree that has been accepted to be removed. The rest of the site benefits from a, a tree preservation order that was put on earlier this year. This tree was always accepted as coming out because we always knew that the police was lo were looking to come on this site. It was a requirement of their development and we'll see that as we move through. And the third reason is I want to show this access point here. There's actually two main accesses, one in here and one in here. And then this is a third emergency access. Should either of those be blocked? Because obviously the, the police vehicles need to, to uh, exit the location at pace if, if that's the case. And as I said, this is why I showed you the oak tree. It give, gives us an idea to uh, orientate ourselves. And this is the view looking from the bridge over the A47. The arrows pointing this way um, go towards the park and ride site. That's the oak tree, as I said before. The building would be roughly in this area. This next one shows us that inner link road that I referred to earlier on that services the development. That's the oak tree building primarily in this area here, the main building that is. Uh, and this is a view just to show the main entrance to the site, which shows it's on the, on the right hand side of this tree that's, that's been removed. These trees are being retained in there and the building in this area. And this is a view looking towards the retained hedge uh, and tree boundary that runs along Broadland Way. For those who know it, Broadland Way um, goes right up to uh, Green Lane as is, and then Poppy Way that goes on to Broadland North Way. This is a very mature hedgerow and trees that will be retained and, and will continue to provide screening to, the, to this area. And this is just a view from the new estate road looking in it, the building within that area there. Just wanted to show this plan just to again orientate ourselves to show that trees being removed there issues about the uh, the impact on the access and also the building footprint that shows the the layout of the scheme but actually this one next this cg visual gives you a much better idea about what the buildings and, and the ancillary buildings will look like i'm going to move on to the next slide because we've got the building heights on here it's a bit bit busy but i think it's worth looking at the, the main access in here, the public access in particular, is going to be through this area uh, where it says primary access. This building here is the interview building uh, and, and the public uh, entrance to the site. This building here is the main office area. That's 10.1 metres in height, referred to before that, that uh, plan that said we could be looking up to, to 20 metres in height. This is below that height significantly and also below the height of the Aviva building, if you can picture it on the... Um, Broadland Business Park, building drops down to 5.2 metres over here to the garage. And then this is the secondary access in which the, the staff can access the car park as well. A number of other buildings that I've got for um, CGs to show you, but I want to draw your attention to the mast here at the rear, which is 35 metres in height, which obviously is, is significant in its size. Um, that is a similar height to the, the ones that are at Wyndham and to at Swatham. The reason for that 
is because they need direct line of sight for security purposes and it is a, a prerequisite prerequisite of this development that happens and, and goes ahead but no objections from the broads authority um, and and it sit, uh, and no residents nearby either so i'm going to run you through some slides here that there's a number but I'll, I'll sort of canter through them that's the building um it's primarily going to be uh, built from buff brick with recessed dark brick panels and sort of bookended staircases and it's also going to have some composite paneling so this sort of Grayer areas, the buff brick, the, the darker area in here is that recessed um, black brick, and then the composite panelling, obviously, for the, for the roof and some of the ancillary buildings. So that's how it will sit in terms of the, the link road within the develop, uh, within the Broadland Gate area. This is the access, um, this is secondary access there. You see the mast in the background. This is the view going into that interview building you'll see sits well and, and sits in, in similar style and design to that main building. This is it in close up. This is the rear entrance where the car park would be and also the main entrance for the staff to go in because obviously the staff need a secure area to go into the rear. There it is in detail. And then we've just got some of the more ancillary buildings, the carport, the stores, and there's the mast. So I'm just going to leave you with that view whilst I just talk through the assessment of the scheme. And just, sorry, can someone just confirm you can still see that screen? Yes. Super, great. Um, so yeah, really the key considerations of the application are discussed in the assessment section of the report on pages 49 to 55 of the agenda. But I do want to draw members' attention to a couple of the fundamental matters in relation to its determination. And these are the principle of the development and the design layout and amenity of the development. Now, from a principle perspective, Section 38.6 of the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act requires that applications for planning permission are determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The development's located on a plot of, land, plot of land that forms part of an allocation, as I've referred to, and that's GT10 of the Growth Triangle Area Action Plan for employment-led development. And furthermore, the wider site benefits from outline approval for the same. Now, this proposal is actually a sui generis use, so it is strictly contrary to the provisions of that development plan, and that's why the application is presented to you today. The outline approval um, didn't have this use in, and so this is a standalone application, but it has said it is contrary to the provisions of that development plan. But actually, I consider this proposal to be completely in line with the principle of both the policy and the outline approval. And by that, I mean it's an office-led employment development housing 240 jobs. It's exactly the kind of thing we would want on, on this business plan. And so therefore, I consider that the principle of development is acceptable. I also consider the design of the buildings to be aesthetically pleasing, the layout to be well thought through, the impact on the closest residents to be minimal, and overall that this development will be a positive addition to the Broad and Gate business park. I think it's notable as well that the majority of the consultee comments have been positive and that where there have been no objections raised from the local residents. Uh, Postwick and Witten Parish Council, as is suggested in the report, have raised concerns about siren noises, and that's completely understandable, but the police vehicles will not be using these until they're away from the site. So moving on to recommendation, given this presentation, and as per page 55 of the agenda, um, the committee is recommended to approve this application, subject to the conditions and reasons on pages 55 to 56 of the agenda. Thank you, Chair. I'll just stop sharing. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Very much appreciated. Okay, members, do you have any questions in relation to that presentation for the officer? Yes, please, Chair. Okay, Councillor Riley. Yeah, uh, thank you. And um, yeah, I completely understand the uh, <clears throat> recommendation here in terms of the business um, situation, plus also the jobs. It fits very very well into um, the overall plan uh, in terms of strategy here as well. Just, I'm just returning to page 47. If I could just, if you could just spend for me, clarify 0.45. Uh, environment, environmental health officer, noise and lighting. First paragraph, lighting. Lighting scheme looks okay, but I take it applicant has not submitted any modelling 
many light overspill into neighbouring land would be useful if this was considered and confirmed that any overspill of light will be strictly controlled. I've, I've just been to conditions and I'm not seeing any reference there. So I just wonder if you could uh, make reference to that. And I've got one other one, Chair, um, uh, in terms of the last paragraph there, which, I, which I'll come back on to. Okay. Ben. Certainly, Councillor. Yeah, I, I think that's my, we well, know that is my, my mistake there. I have had a further response from the Environmental Health Officer subsequent once subsequent um, lighting plans have been submitted by the applicant and they've now agreed that it is acceptable. So sorry, that's my fault. I should have put that in. Could, could we have it amended, um, you know, following this? It, it, can we perhaps make a, yeah, should we make a note of that in the, the minutes, if that's okay? Thank you. Yeah, I think we do need, to, we've done it subsequently, Chair, before, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And the last yeah. point, um, will you be happy to put on the conditional to control hours of operating during construction Ensuring dust is controlled, etc., as part of construction management plan. Uh, I think there is a model condition for this, but I haven't seen the model condition yet. Again, could you just clarify, please, Ben? Yeah, again, and, uh, that's my error. I, I, I feel as though I might have sent a slightly earlier version of the report. There, there is that has been discussed, and, and the applicants have fine to put a construction management plan that we would then agree through the condition. Uh, yeah, so again, apologies for that. Okay, and again, same thing, Chair, um, back on the minutes so that... Yeah, it'll be recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Okay, ben. no problem. Thank you. Um, members, any further questions in relation to the presentation? <coughs> okay, thank you very much. This will bring us to our public speaking, and if I can just advise that uh, we have... Let me just get the details. We have Mark Cambridge. Is, um, apologies if I'm saying your surname wrong. Uh, Mark, could you just um, advise, um, if I can just advise you that um, we, uh, as per the other, the other application, we uh, don't have a, um, a clock that we can put up the timing for you. So, um, but just before we move on to that, I just need to say that we, um, we don't have any just to clarify that we don't have any public speakers from the parish council, nor do we have any public speakers objecting to the application. However, Mark Cambridge is in attendance and will be happy to answer any questions that we should have. So I'm taking it, Mark, that you don't wish to um, to, to use your five minutes to, to speak as such. You're just here for questions. Uh, yes, Chair. I mean, I, if it's OK, I just obviously just would like to say um, that obviously this is a... Uh... <coughs> It's required as part of the police in 2020 model and obviously this is running in tandem with the the western hub at Swaffham, which is due for handover both these uh, are sort of critical infrastructure facilities on the on the network which is why they've been chosen um Swatham's due to be completed like say in a few weeks and and this one will then hopefully if approved um move, move forward um it i say the as Ben confirmed, we're happy with the conditions in terms of the line, the construction management. We have discussed that with him. Um, so that's not a problem. There's no issues with that. Um, and yeah, obviously happy to answer any questions. We'd obviously just like to say that yeah, it's been um, it's been a really collaborative approach and, and thanks to Ben and the team, it's been it's been a really positive um, experience. Um, we've had some challenges with time scales in terms of client requirements, but um, no, it's been good and, and thanks to the planning team, it's been it's been a really positive, positive application. Okay, thank you. Mark, can you just advise the committee what your role has been in this? Um... Sorry, yes, uh, I, sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm Mark Cambridge, yeah. I'm Director and Architect at Chaplin Farrant. So we are the return consultants for Norfolk and Suffolk Constabulary. So we are the uh, architects, engineers um, and the multidisciplinary consultants for the scheme for the force. Okay, thank you. Members, do you have any questions for, for Mark in relation to the application? No, that's good. Well, thank you for, Mark, for, for being with us this morning. It's, it's very much appreciated. But uh, that will bring our public speaking to a close. So, members, we will now go into discussion um, in relation to the application in front of us. And again, you will remain unmuted as a committee. And please, can I ask if you have any comments that you should um, ask any questions of the officers? Please register your request to do so through the chat, and I'll come to you in turn. After this discussion, the committee will then determine the decision of the application on proposal and seconding of the application. And if necessary, during the discussion, Officer Lincoln and Officer Burgess will be able to respond to any questions accordingly. 
and um, members after a private discussion I will roll call to confirm your agreement that there's no further comments before we should go to the vote on the application. Members do you have any questions in relation to the application or any discussion that you would like to bring forward? Okay. Uh, so. uh, Jim, I, I, um, I don't have a question but uh, I think clearly it is a very uh, uh, sympathetic de development in, in what is required, uh, etc. And I think uh, the uh, layout design of the uh, of the buildings is uh, is extremely good and sympathetic to uh, the area. And uh, I'd like to um, propose uh, that we approve this. Okay, and I'd like to it, uh, first, Jim. Second, okay. We've got we've got quite a few people seconding it, so Dawn, I'll let you take your um, your choice on and who who's got there first. Okay, so Leah, can I just confirm that there's no other questions or no one wishes to speak before we go to the vote? Um, Caroline did have a her hand raised. Was that was to say? Yeah, I just I just oh, want sorry, to say Caroline, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's all right. I just think the design is lovely. I think that's a very nicely designed um, police station, <laughs> and I think we should approve it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, Officer Matthew, can you just tell me who you've recorded as the seconder for that proposal? Councillor Fulcher proposed it. And who did you record as the seconder? Did you put it down as myself? Sorry. Yeah, I'll pop it down as yourself, Chairman. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very <laughs> much. Okay, so members, it has been proposed by Councillor Fulcher and seconded by um, myself, Councillor Lawn, that we should, as a committee, agree to the recommendation to approve this application subject to conditions as stated on page 55 and 56 of your papers. Okay, Officer Matthews, if you could please go to the roll call uh, for the vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. So we're voting on the recommendation as it stands, together with the two additional um, matters that were raised during the debate. So, Councillor Adams, are you for or against? For. Thank you. Councillor Brennan? For. Councillor Fulger? For. Councillor Karimi Guvenlu? For. Councillor Lorne? For. Councillor Prutton? For. Councillor Riley? With the two, two additional um, dawn, as I mentioned, thank okay. you. <laughs> and Councillor Ward. Four. Chairman, that's unanimous with eight members voting for and, and against, so that recommendation is carried. Okay, wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen for your time in relation to that application this morning. Can I ask the members if you would like to have another five minute break or would you be happy to carry on with the second application, or the third application? Councillor Riley, do you want to carry on or you want to have a break? Yes, uh, could, I, could I have a five minute break please? Of course, of course, there's no problem at all. And um, okay, so it's 11.13, we'll see you back at 11.18, Councillor Riley. Okay, thank you. If you can turn your uh, videos and um, your microphones off, please.
Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I think that we're all present and correct, but I will just ask Officer Matthews again, please, if you could do a roll call of the members to just to confirm that we are all in attendance. Sorry, rookie error. <laughs> Councillor Adams. I'll come back to Councillor Adams in a moment. Councillor Brennan. Present. Councillor Fulger. Present. Councillor Karimi Guvanlu. Present. Councillor Lorne. Present. Councillor Prutton. Present. Councillor Riley. Present. Councillor Ward. Present. And Councillor Adams. Present. Thank you. That completes the roll call, Chairman. Everyone's in attendance. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And can I just confirm that we have the public speakers registered to speak today linked into our meeting? Yes. OK, I can see Dr. Foreman. Thank you very much. And um, we've also got Richard Hootson. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, and uh, that will take us on to our application number three, 2020-0403, uh, Land South of Poppy Way. And uh, we will move over to... Officer Burgess again, please. Thank you for your, your time. And if you could go ahead with the presentation. Great stuff. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share the screen again. So, yeah, this is land to the south of Poppy Way. Again, we're at Broadland Gate Business Park in Posit, which is helpful because we know where we are. And it's the variation of condition 10 of 2008 1773 to allow a discount food store. Again, a few slides less than the last one. And we probably know where we are from the last game, but just for the record, south here is the A47. Running south to north is the Broadland North Way. Across the north here, going over towards Broadland Way, which is this road. This is Poppy Way that I refer to a number of times. This is a roundabout that serves the link road that goes through the development like that. And then in detail, that's the site. This is the residential properties to the south again. It's the uh, Viva building to get our bearings. And again, that's that road that goes through it and the new board, the North Way Posit Junction. Just wanted to, to bring this slide up again. We had it on the last presentation, which is perhaps even more relevant with this one. Site sits in, in there in the allocation of GT10 of the Growth Triangle Area Action Plan. Just to give a bit more detail on this to the north in this GT11 allocation, there are two applications for residential development. One north of Smee Lane, this is Smee Lane here, in this area here, um, that has been approved and outlined for around about 300 plus dwellings. And one to the south, which has been, a, is currently an application that's in, it's a hybrid application for part outline, part full, for upwards of 500 houses. So it just goes to show that this area is really starting to, to stay, take shape uh, and, and in a not too distant future, residents will be moving in within the area. Just to show you the, the original plan as we proposed from the outline approval, 2008-1773, just to show where the applicant's site is proposed in that red um, oblong that we have there. Just wanted to give you an idea that, that this site is changing now. Broadland Gate is, was a point in time it was an outline approval that proposed a number of different uses, obviously primarily um, employment led with the B1 to B8 uses, but it also proposed a hotel, service departments um, and a couple of other uses that perhaps aren't really in fashion at the moment and, and don't necessarily sit with the proposed way that this development is, is building up and, and is happening. So it's changing this the development and, and changing with the times, hence why we have not just this application, but the, the previous one for the police station in that is slightly contrary to the provisions of this proposal, um, but still from a, an officer perspective, at least are, are, are acceptable and appropriate uses. There's the site location specifically. And then I want to take you through some, some photographs. So I've used those residential properties to, sorry, I'll just go back to the previous slide. There's those residential properties, just to so we're clear. And I've used them within these photographs just to get our orientation. So there they are in that red sphere. This road here at the frontage is the access road into the development. This road that you can just see up there is Poppy Way. 
Uh, and in here is a pro is where the site approximately is just behind this uh, a small bun, probably about a metre high that. This is the view then out on the roundabout that I referred to earlier. That's the access road going south that serves the development and the residential properties that are just behind these trees. And um, that's Poppy Way running along the north of the south, uh, site, sorry. And that's the bund around it again. And again, the final uh, photograph that just shows you the residential properties there. This shows you Poppy Way going towards the roundabout. Oh, sorry. Um, you can see the Aviva buildings in the background there. Uh, and the access into the site is down here and the site is in this location. This plan is a sequential site assessment catchment plan uh, and it shows the extent of the search that the applicants did for alternative locations for this sort of development that they're proposing uh, within a five minute journey from the site. Now this and the impact on the retail of, of, of the area is required uh, through the MPPF and, and then through local policy. I'll, I'll explain that in more detail in my assessment. I just wanted to show this plan uh, and I may well leave it up. That's the that's the last site I, uh, photograph I had. Sorry, location plan I had. Um, I'll leave the sequential site plan up. I think whilst I just talk through the assessment. So the key consideration of this application is, is whether the principle of the variation of condition ten of the outline approval two thousand and eight seventeen seventy three um, is acceptable or not. And and this is given on in much more detail on pages 63 to 68 of the agenda. However, I do want to bring certain things to members' attention today. So again, Section 3860 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 requires applications for planning permission to be determined in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The development is located on a plot of land that forms part of the allocation GT10, as I've referred to in the Growth Triangle Area Action Plan, for employment led development and furthermore the wider site benefits from the outline approval for the same now policy 10 amongst other things but very relevant to this scheme states that the site will deliver up to 4500 square meters of a1 a2 a3 and a4 uses and this is set out in condition 10 which is the one we're looking to vary now the a1 units are specifically limited to 2,400 square metres in total, and the proposed variation through this application remains in line with the policy, which did not specify the size of the units. However, the policy also referred to the site being developed in accordance with the outline planning permission, and therefore, whilst the application does not alter the principle, the uses for the amount of each specified use, in this case, A1 retail uses, which Confusingly, in our class E uses in the new use classes order, but we, if we need to talk about that later, we can. Uh, the proposed change is to remove the precise specification of the format of the units to permit one single retail unit rather than several small ones, in effect. And as this detail is different to the outline, it requires permission and is therefore contrary to the development plan. This condition specifically limits the individual A1 units to 500 square metres in size which would mean that the overall 2,400 square metre retail use could have no more than four units of this size, but could have smaller units. And so the application is seeking to remove the 500 square metre cap on individual A1 units to allow for the delivery of a medium sized food store of approximately 1,900 square metres. Now, look, this is a clear shift away from the plan envisaged for Borland Gate when it was first promoted, and that was to have smaller ancillary ancillary retail unit uses, sorry, supporting the main employment uses. However, as I've touched on before, this was a point in time and 12 plus years of uh, elapsed since this original vision, vision, sorry, for the site and the market for employment land having changed considerably. And furthermore, as I, I touched on before, large scale residential development has been approved through the north of Broadland Gate in the intervening time, meaning that a medium scale supermarket on this site would be beneficial for those future residents. Further to this, and importantly, which is why I've just left up that slide, is that the applicants have been required to undertake a sequential site assessment to consider whether there are suitable alternative sites for a retail use of this size and to outline the way the store operates and the impact of the proposal. The assessment concluded that there are no suitable or available sequentially preferable sites to accommodate the proposed development, even with the application of appropriate flexibility to the search 
uh, site search parameters. And furthermore, it concluded that the trading impacts of a new discount food store on existing retailers and centres, the local centres, are very limited. I can go with these findings uh, from an officer point of view and consider that a single retail unit of this size proposed would be complementary to the existing retail offer in the area. So moving on to recommendation and given this presentation, as per page 68 of the agenda, the committee is recommended to approve this application to remove the 500 square meters restriction on any individual A1 use. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'll stop, uh, stop my screen. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, and can I ask members, do you have any questions for the officer in relation to that presentation? No, okay, wonderful, thank you very much. At this point, it, you will go to our public speaking and um, Officer Atkinson, can I please ask you to unmute Dr. Foreman, please? Like, no, still, um, maybe Dr. Foreman needs to unmute himself. I think you have to accept it, sorry. Okay, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, Dr. Foreman. And if I could please ask you to address the committee, you will have five minutes to address the committee. And unfortunately, we don't have a clock that we can share as on the screen, as that would block you out from our members. So um, the host will advise you when you have one minute remaining, is that acceptable to you? Yes, it is. Thank you. If you could please introduce yourself to the committee and you will have five minutes starting from now. Thank you, Council, and thank you uh, to the committee for, uh, for hearing from me today. My name is Thomas Foreman, and I'm the Town Clerk at Fort St Andrew Town Council. We appreciate the opportunity to address you on the application to vary Condition 10 of Application 2008-1773, which has been submitted by Lidl UK. The Town Council have strong objections to this application in the belief that the variation is unnecessary and that it will have a negative impact on Fort St Andrew, as well as the surrounding parishes. Thorpe St Andrew, alongside our surrounding partner councils, were very supportive of the original planning brief. This change flies in the face of goodwill and cooperation, which has been evident since the plans to develop Dussendale, St Andrew's Business Park, Meridian Business Park, Broadland Business Park and Broadland Gate were submitted. Full cooperation has been present because equality development was always the ambition. We as a council were a strong proponent of condition 10, believing the limitation on individual units of 500 square metres, with a total limitation of 2,400 square metres in A1 class, balanced the needs of the retailers and the local area positively. In looking at the NPPF, the application refers to section six, reaffirming the importance of supporting economic growth and productivity, taking account of local business needs and wider opportunities for development. We do not find any convincing arguments that local business needs and opportunities for economic growth through development are made out. The fact is that locally we are seeing a greater resurgence of businesses seeking smaller units, supporting the SME sector. Nor do we accept the needs of a business with sales of 6.4 billion in the UK could be considered a local business or provide significantly uh, greater opportunity for local economic growth than the SMEs that might take their place. Despite the argument that Lidl is distinct from the likes of Sainsbury's, by their own account, they are all competitors in the grocery sector, with Lidl overtaking supermarkets like Waitrose and competing actively with others like the cooperative. Although they are not the full retail offering, many of us do use Lidl as our main weekly shop and we travel more than five minutes for it. This is because unlike the urban catchment, the suburbs greater distances are frequently travelled and the location of the proposed Lidl would likely attract significant numbers of vehicles passing through on the Broadland Northway and potentially the nearby A47. There will be significant impact upon local traffic movements and residents and this is not what was envisaged when planning was agreed. By permitting a large international business to take this space, you would be inviting the proliferation of large advertising signage like those which plague towns elsewhere. The inclusion of smaller business units retains the respect and sophisticated approach to the town for visitors and residents alike. 
the town council is asking you to be pro-business, specifically pro-SMEs and other businesses that this site was designed for, as opposed to big business who want this site because they can't currently find a better one. It is therefore our submission that the sequential assessment does not make the case for the variation and we ask the committee to refuse the application. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you Thomas Foreman. And if I could please ask members, do you have any questions for our public speaker? Councillor Ward, you might need to unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you Councillor Foreman for that. So can I just ask you, do you, do you really believe that smaller units as were originally proposed would be enough to service the food needs of another 700 to 800 houses bearing in mind that the nearest large supermarket Sainsbury's is almost operating to capacity especially on a Saturday when it's difficult to get a parking space. I mean obviously I represent the views of the councillors that considered the application I know that the councillors did have a discussion at length about what the impact would be on, on the houses that you're talking about and whether Sainsbury's, the cooperative uh, and other supermarkets in the local area would be able to uh, fill that capacity and, and they felt that it could. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, any further questions? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr Foreman, for your time. It's very much appreciated. And we thank will you, now councillors. move on to our second speaker of the morning and Mr Richard Hudson. Leah, can you please unmute Mr Hudson? Okay, thank you. Welcome to our meeting this morning. Mr Hudson, you will have five minutes to address the committee. Unfortunately, we do not have a clock that we can share on the screen as it would block you from the members of the committee. However, the host of our meeting will advise you when you have one minute. Is that acceptable to you? It is indeed. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr Hudson. Please introduce yourself to the committee and you have five minutes starting from now. Uh, good morning, Chair and Council Members. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you in support of our application. My name is Richard Hewson, Planning Partner at Rapley is representing the applicant, which is Lidl. An overview, this application is to seek the very planning condition number 10 to the outline approval at Broadland Business Park, known as Broadland Gate. The outline planning consent allowed a variety of land uses to come forward including up to 2,400 square metres of retail floor space in units up to 500 square metres. Therefore, we're seeking a variation to the planning condition number 10 that will allow a little food store of 1,900 square metres to come forward. There will be no variation in the overall quantum of floor space approved in the original outline. In fact, there will still be 500 square metres of retail floor space remaining in lieu of the proposed little food store. Simply, we are seeking to change uh, the compromise in terms of the unit size. Benefits of the proposal. The new Lidl store is in line with Lidl's current specifications to provide a customer focused store, which will provide a series of benefits to the local area, including improved shopping choice and provision of a new mainstream discount food store. A contemporary design building with environmental friendly features such as solar panels, electric vehicle charging points, and it will boost the economy that will generate up to 40 new local employment jobs. Therefore, the proposal fully accords with the key aims of national planning policy framework, which promotes the presumption in favor of sustainable development and encourages granting permission to prioritize economic growth and jobs. Consultee responses. In terms of the consultee responses to date, there are no statutory consultee objections relating to the scheme. However, the town council concerns about the sequential site assessment have been brought to our attention. As part of our sequential site assessment, we have scoped out with the planning officers which sites are required to be assessed, of which six sites came forward. Through our assessment, no sites could accommodate the little food store format that requires a minimum floor space of 1,900 square meters. This position has been acknowledged and accepted by the planning case officer. In conclusion, the proposed variation of condition number 10 is deemed acceptable in technical terms as reflected through the planning committee report and no objections through, received through statutory consultees. The development will deliver a number of tangible benefits to Broadland Gate with a multi-million pound investment in the area. On that basis, I respectfully request that members vote to approve the application 
in line with the plan officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. So sorry. Um, members, do you have any questions for our public speaker? Councillor Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Hudson. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm sure that you, you and your clients have done a great deal of work in trying to find a suitable site for their proposed development. Uh, to my knowledge, there is a large pocket of land on the Broadland Business Park, alongside the Aviva storage depot and opposite the macro building. And yet you're saying, or your client is saying that there is no other suitable land anywhere. Going back to the original premise of Broadland Gate, which would be an employment and business park and not a retail development. What concerns me, although you may not want to comment on this, is if we were to allow this development, and then the next thing we'll have is another tranche of other retailers wanting to move in as well alongside you. So we've gone directly against the original premise of a employment and business park. So is there a reason why you haven't taken up the possibility of the land which is available on the broader business park, may I ask? So um, obviously we have, we have to look at sites that are available to us, either uh, on the market or are uh, available in terms of bringing them forward. Um, to the point in terms of uh, the planning system has recently changed as of the 1st September and um, your planning case officer was going to allude to this. Obviously, retail now is under use class E, uh, which is obviously forms part of B1 offices as well. So in terms of the location, it actually conforms with uh, sites that can come forward now. Okay. Okay, yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, okay. may, may I just say a little more, Chair? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I fully concur with what you just said, Mr. Hewson, but it is my understanding, please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, that the parcel of land to which I'm referring alongside an opposite macro uh, was originally going to be developed or proposed to be developed by IKEA, which is also a retail outlet. But as my knowledge goes back, they decided against taking up that opportunity at the time because the road infrastructure wasn't in place and they didn't see that they were going to be able to operate successfully. So it would appear that that parcel of land is available, presumably had some sort of approval prior to my tenure within the planning committee for retail use. So again, I, I have to wonder why you're trying to change this one uh, when there's another one apparently available. Uh, well, I'm confused. Forgive me. Yeah. Forgive sorry, me. sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry thank you. Forgive Councillor Long, can myself or Ben Pock come in there or would you like us to yeah, come in? in terms I, just of... wanted, I just wanted to say I, that I think this maybe is a discussion for our officers as opposed to Mr. Houston. He can't really comment on. Okay, yep, yeah, I appreciate that, Chair. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so if there's no other further questions for Mr. Houston, then we will say thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, okay. we will carry on with this uh, discussion as, as a committee. So um, that brings our public speaking to a close. If I can just ask either Officer Lincoln or Sir Burgess, if you'd like to address um, Councillor Brennan's points, please, that would be great. Would you like to start, Ben, and then I can always mop anything up? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, I think it's, look, it's an interesting one, isn't it, really? The, the idea for the original Broadland Business Park was, was, to be fair, very similar to the Broadland Gate Business Park, which was that it wouldn't have a large amount of retail on. Uh, applications like Macro did come on uh, because of points in time, as I've referred to already. And they, they would have probably at the time, although forgive me, I don't know for definite, been, been perhaps contrary to the provisions of the development plan. And we would have had to take it through this similar sort of, of, of scenario through committee. But focusing on this one specifically and, and looking at that site you refer to, um, this application and this outline approval only has permission for a maximum of 2,500 square metres of, of A1 retail. Um, if another supermarket were to come forward, uh, that can hopefully allay your concerns, then they wouldn't be able to, to do that unless it was contrary to the provisions of the development plan. It would then have to come back before members of the planning committee and 
I, I, you know, never say never in planning, but from an officer, officer perspective, we wouldn't look, be looking to support that. So I won't name any of the supermarkets, but say a larger supermarket came in, um, we wouldn't look, be looking to support this at, at that time. And I think hopefully you can see from the previous application and the approvals I've referred to as well, that actually we're really starting to see that business park fill up in, in sort of the uses that we've been looking for. I am sorry, I'll labor the point slightly, but this is a really good location for this sort of use. Um, immediately to the south of residential properties, a large amount of residential properties that have got permission or are close to permission. Um, I'm not doubting that the, the site that, that you referred to as well wouldn't be a, a decent location, but this one, in my opinion, would be a better site as well. And again, just the final thing from me, I suppose, is that the market will drive these things as well. I, I, it's not for us to determine or decide now, but I've got no doubt that there might be different values and, and costs associated with buying either site. And I'm sure the applicant has factored that into their decision and proposal to, to come on this location. Okay, thank you. Councillor Brennan, does that answer your queries? Can I just, sorry, before we oh, go sorry, back to that, can I just add absolutely. something as well? Yes, yeah, sorry, Sue. Um, in terms of um, some of the, the questions you'd asked, the sequential um, assessment requires us to look at a sequential approach, i.e. town centre first, then edge of centre, then out of centre. So I haven't got the details of that site in front of me, but what you're describing, it's, it sounds like a similar site in terms of out of centre location to what we're considering here. So actually sequentially, it's no preferable to what we've got in front of us. So I think that's the one point I would make. And I guess the second point in terms of um, any further application that would come forward for a, re a retail use, we would be requiring a sequential approach and an impact assessment to be considered for any further retail. If that was a different site to this, perhaps um, on the site that you're suggesting, those in combination, we would have to look at the retail impact of that particular pro proposal in itself in terms of the merits of that scheme. So I'd, by allowing this doesn't necessarily mean that something else will be acceptable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Um, it doesn't satisfy me wholly because, again, going back, I thought the concept behind the retail development that was intended within Broadland Gate was it would be small units to primarily service the businesses on the site. So we had, so we say, cafes and small retail establishments for the prime benefit of the, the employees on site not to service a larger area of development of housing. That, that, that's why I'm finding it difficult to comprehend at the moment. Okay. Apologies. Can I, can I, I, sorry, Chair, could I just... just um, I don't disagree. I don't disagree at all. And, and, and um, I tried to allude to that in my presentation. That was the original idea. Um, that idea was, was now 12 plus years ago um, and, and the market has moved on. Um, if we could have developed it out in that way, that, that's how it would have been, because that was how it was envisaged. But things have moved on since then. The market's changed, but also the significant amount of residential properties that have been approved or are close to being approved, there's been a significant change as well since then. So it, it's just a different point in time, and we're trying to react to that, and, and the market is reacting to that by, by, the, by little, little proposing to come to this location. Okay. Okay, any other comments at the moment okay i just i just like to make a comment and um i just i totally understand what the officers are saying and i i see it from both sides but i've got um serious concerns that if instead of um making um an exception we'll be making a president for this this site now um i think that um especially in today's climate and i do appreciate that you're saying that times have moved on in the last 10 12 years but in the last six months, things have changed considerably. And I've got concerns that we're going to be, that through COVID, we, we know that lots of businesses are trying to, to, to reassess their costs and, um, and how they, they go forward in the next few months. But I, I've got concerns that we, we've got the planning application here for the small businesses that, um, you know, if, if they do want to downsize, if they want to move out of the city or somewhere that's the high, you know, extortionate rates, then this is a prime development for them to do that. And I think sometimes this, if we think back to whenever this was considered, maybe this is what we, we did have in mind was the, was the small businesses to be there. 
Um, and I think that are we are we then going to take it away whenever people businesses need it most that we're, we're going to take it away and push it for the larger developers? Can you just tell me if if I, I believe that to take up this site is is going to take up what would be equivalent of five small businesses? Is that right? Um, no, not quite. It's um, so nineteen hundred square meters. Um, so in effect, it's just under four because well, you... it was limited oh, right, four. to okay. five hundred square meters uh, beforehand. Okay, and, and forgive me for not knowing this, but how many small units will that then leave? Oh, if, well, if we... it, it would leave one. One. It would just yeah. So um, so I'm just I, I'm just. Um, Considering that at the moment, um, whilst Councillor Ward, while you um, you would like to put your point forward. Okay, uh, thank you. Chair, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just come back to this fact that there's seven or eight hundred houses <coughs> going to be built right across the road from this, from where this little is proposed. Now, do we really want all those eight hundred households jumping in their cars and driving down to Sainsbury's? There wouldn't be any room in the car park. They'd be parking on Vane Close, no doubt. Uh, now, another point that was made was that people would be travelling a long distance to get there. Well, we've got little in, in Sproston, we've got Aldi at the Heart Sea, so they wouldn't be travelling very far at all. And uh, we've, we've seen in Sproston how, how a little can live very comfortably with a big supermarket. It's within a stone's throw of, of Tesco in Sproston, and they both sit very comfortably together there, and they're both doing good business, I understand. So I, I think we should welcome this, this uh, application and I would move the officer's recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Riley. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is a really, really difficult one and, and, and I, I sense, Chair, also of your contribution, that's sort of reflecting uh, some of my thoughts around this as well. It's, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the developer did um, articulate that uh, it would leave 500 square feet, so it'd leave one. Uh, in his contribution, oh, Ben's just yeah. Ben's just reconfirmed that as well. Um, the original concept um, of, of the five units and, and the SMEs, um, you know, was clearly clearly a good strategy. I think what I'm wrestling with at the moment is, is that you know this was 12 years ago, and um, we've now got, if I'm correct, Ben, and I need you just to clarify this as I go as well, that subsequent to that, we've now got further housing development what, that wasn't necessarily envisaged at mm. that time, which is altered the nature of the site. Is that correct? I think just to just to be clear, well, no, no, I was going to say there to be clear, it was part of the growth triangle area okay. action. Plan, yeah. But when the, when the uh, original application was submitted, that area action plan wasn't in place. So it would be fair to say that it wasn't in it wasn't in a plan, but yes, it was envisaged. However, we've seen those applications coming forward. Yeah, okay, fine. So 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 basically this is broad strokes strokes term in terms of the residential. This is all where roughly where uh, it was envisaged in the first place, Ben. This is what I'm I'm seeing. Now the key issue here is is that there's to my mind, the residential um, <clears throat> is being factored in here in terms of the support if you like for this for um, a little in that area and that somehow that's changed direction um i do have a lot of sympathy for what the the town and parish councils are saying here in terms of the original concept and also there is a move going on economically um if you go down which i'm frequently out in london you go to other places as well the the, the big high street uh, is actually moving into s smaller units the, the huge stores, there's a shift going on. We've had online, but there's a shift going on into smaller units now. And, it's, and that, is, that is occurring, around, especially around niche, uh, et cetera. Um, all the indicators are pointing down that road. And I'm a little bit concerned, as Sue um, said as well, um, that um, if we go down this road, we'd have just one 500 unit left and then we've cut off that opportunity. I, I, I have to say that the comment, Ben, that you made around the economic driver uh, in terms of little themselves and the sequential issue, which, which also Nigel had raised as well about, well, the marketplace, and this could be more economically, more viable for 
did all than the other site, it's really not my concern. I don't think it should be this committee's concern as well. There's actually a commercial operator. Yeah, they want to come here because it's cheaper than going to the other side. Whatever. That's not the concern here. Um, the concern here is 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 around the original proposal. How does that fit now? What what are we looking at in terms of the future around the the operation? And it is extremely you know in terms of that site and, and, and available units. It's an extremely difficult decision to make on this one actually. Um, and I'm 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 kind of veering one way and then veering another way and then back and forwards on this one as well. Um, and I'm hoping for some sort of definitive thing to come forward to tip me one way or the other on this, but it is extremely difficult. And I'm very reluctant to cut out, get rid of uh, this opportunity for five units um, in relation to this little project. I do understand Council Wall's point as well around seven to 800 you know, residents. Um, so it's very, very difficult. Um, and I can't tip one way or the other at the moment on this chair. Okay, thank you. Caroline, did you have something? Yeah, to add? can I ask, um, just to clarify, these five units, are they within just plot two of the Broadland Gate? Is that what you're talking about? So, I'm looking at this plan here. The, yeah, yeah, the sure. Plot one. Yeah. So that, that plan was, it was indicative. Um, and we are looking at a change to to that indicative plan now as well. So, uh, sort of as I said before, the the plans have moved on since that original application was was approved. And um, I'm not going to labour the market point, but the market has changed as well. That location was on the plan you've got there for B yeah. one to B eight uses, but it was only ever an indicative plan. It didn't necessarily mean that it was going to be there so in theory these these five units that you're talking about would be in plot two mm -hmm. oh, sorry so yes yeah, so the plan you've got yeah. they would yeah that would be plot two okay so we've got all the other plots we've got plot three plot four plot five plot six which could be small units as well yeah so in theory yeah um, so we're not we're not particularly losing a lot of plots are we not a mm -hmm. lot of units as such in the whole scheme of the of the broad gate it's the restriction, wait, Ben. Sorry, sorry, Steve. Just, 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 sure. wait, just let Ben reply. Yeah, I just, I just wonder whether it would be helpful to, to me just to, to come back on, on a couple of those points from, from both the councillors there. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose there's a, a few things to consider here. The, the original outline application, as I've referred to and, and as has been, oh, been yeah. well raised by them today, um, did have a different vision than perhaps what's being proposed now. Um, but in those intervening years, those smaller units haven't been taken up by anyone. I, I've worked closely over the years with the promoters of this scheme, um, and they've never had any interest from the smaller retail perspective. So they have looked at a, a different market, they've looked at every potential market, uh, and this is what's come forward at the moment. Interestingly, it's going to be providing 40 jobs on the site, which would probably provide, I'm just speculating, it would probably provide more jobs than those smaller units would do. Mm. And then just to add something further to that as well, mm. in terms of a precedent, you know, we, we, we have limited the, the, the amount of, of retail on this site, but, and I'm fully right if you want to come back to me on this, um, that doesn't mean that we can't bring schemes before members that are contrary to policy. However, I think there's a very clear view amongst members here today um, that they don't want to see this site to be a number of supermarkets on it. So if another one were to come in, contrary to the provisions of the development plan, well, they'd be on an uphill battle because A, the, the, the committee's not in for it, but B, well, actually, the main part of that retail element would have been taken up already by, um, by, by Little were they to come onto it. So we, you know, we'll be well within our rights as officers and as members to go, well, actually, no, we, we don't want a, prolifer a proliferation of uh, supermarkets on this site because that's not what we want. And actually, sorry, I'm labouring the point here, but what we're not seeing that. This is the only one we've seen. What we've seen is the application earlier today for the police base. We've seen um, an application approved for an engineering company, the car showroom. We've seen, um, we'll see at the next committee, a, an electric vehicle charging station. And I know for a fact from speaking to the to the uh, promoters of the scheme that there's other businesses and it is businesses that are interested in the site. So yes, it is a shift. Um, 
am I going to be able to, to, to help you come down on one side or another account to Riley? I'm not convinced I am, but I think it's, it's a real positive that provides business uh, employment and will service the residential development in the area. And yes, it's different to, to that servicing of commercial, but that's the, the, the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Okay, I think I want something to... Okay. Sorry. 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 Just, sorry. Obviously, maybe I hadn't maybe finished, so... Creamy, yeah, maybe we just let Councillor Creamy have her say. And then, Councillor Fulcher, I know that you're waiting to have your say, so just bear with me just a moment. Councillor Creamy. Yeah, can I also add to, to Councillor Ward's um, comment about the residential property? We have got those residential properties being built in that area. Mm -hmm. We also have Broadland Business Park, which a lot of uh, people will be using, probably the supermarket who work there, and further afield to Bar Brundle. You've got the big housing um, allocation in Brundle, plus what was already there. I can see that can be quite a bonus to the area, to be honest. Mm. Okay, thank you, Councillor Karimi. Uh, Councillor Riley, did you just want to reply to what thank Councillor you. Officer Burgess has said, and then we'll come it's, to Councillor Fulcher. Thank you, Chair. And then I, we'll thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I, I think I, I think Ben, you actually have helped me now, um, because um, and 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 just picking up, it's the same point I was making really. The when, the condition, the, the variation on condition here in terms of other units, of course, picking up with Caroline's one, I believe, correct in this assumption that um, that isn't actually possible because you've got within condition um, 10, this restriction of 2,500. So therefore, it was take up four and you're left with this one. So therefore there isn't actually, as I understand it, Caroline, the ability to be able to move on beyond that anyway, because the A1 uh, is now E is already uh, specified within condition 10. Uh, but I think you have actually helped me Ben uh, quite significantly in your contributions just now. So um, I think I'm tipping a certain way now and, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll uh, take, obviously, Sue, so, um, you will see, reflect that, <laughs> be reflecting the votes. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, I'm oh, sorry, Officer Lincoln, did you want to just reply? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, take us back to the policy requirements, really. So it, it may be that the, the current scheme that's permitted in terms of the outline permission and so that's then referred to in the policy may be preferable to members in terms of those smaller units I guess what we've got to remember is we're determining this application on its merits so this application is this acceptable in terms of the retail impact and in terms of the sequential approach so we've had that robust assessment submitted to us we've considered that in terms of in this location in, in the proposal in front of us is that acceptable and retail impact your officers are recommending that this, act, this um, application is acceptable in those terms in relation to paragraphs 86 through to 90 of the MPPF. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is there may be the, the existing permission that you may prefer in a way, but actually we do equally need to put that to, to, to side to some degree and understand whether or not the proposal in front of you is acceptable in planning terms. Thank you for Thank that, you. Officer Lincoln. Councillor Fulcher. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think, as has been said, think, things have, uh, have moved on o over the, since the original si situation. And um, uh, clearly, I would prefer to uh, Ben summing up comments there, which I think are very relevant. And although the situation uh, has many issues and to a degree is finally balanced, uh, I feel that... Um, Councillor Ward's comments were extremely relevant uh, here, bearing in mind the housing development, uh, et cetera. And as he said, you don't want uh, people commuting all over the place when, once, that's, once that's been built. And uh, in, in the light of uh, his comments, I'm uh, uh, very prepared to support uh, the, his recommendation and second that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Brennan, I believe you want to come back. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I do have a slight reputation for being obtuse sometimes. Well, I'll just answer something that uh, Councillor Karimi said uh, about the housing development at Brundle. I know it's not relevant to this actual application, but there is a site uh, uh, by the Brundle roundabout, which has already got an outline planning permission for a supermarket, I understand. So that would service those properties. Um, going back to Councillor Ward's comment about traffic movements, uh, we can't dictate, as, as 
committee or the council how people travel about. Uh, but I don't honestly believe that the people who would move into these new houses will actually walk to this supermarket. They will all get into their cars and will have the traffic movements nonetheless. So I, I, again, I'm finding it very, very difficult at the moment to support this application or this okay. variation, should I say. Okay, Councillor Adams, have I missed you out? Apologies. Councillor Adams? No. I've, no? Okay. No. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm listening okay. intently, Chairman. Yeah. Okay. Is Sorry, there any Chair. further? Sorry, Chair. The, yeah, I did forget one item that I was going to okay. say. Sorry. Um, yeah, going back again to the original premise that we had five small units to service the employees on the site primarily, um, the comment was made we've had uh, nobody coming forward to take up those possible sites. But then until the major development is in place, I can't think of any small enterprise that would want to, shall we say, open a cafe or a small retail establishment when there's nobody on the site at the moment. They're going to wait <laughs> until there is the employment there and the potential for them to run a business and make a profit. So we're denying that possibility by oh, saying, yeah. well, nobody's come forward yet, so let's give it out to somebody else in one unit or, or one big okay. unit and one small unit remaining. So thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Yeah, I've heard a lot of, um, sort of debate and uh, members uh, expressing uh, concern at this development. But what I haven't heard from those that are objecting to it is the grounds for refusal. Um, I haven't heard anything which would substantiate a refusal at this stage. Now, if there are those members who feel this shouldn't happen, they really should be coming forward with a reason why it should be refused on what policy grounds. That's all I've got to say at this stage, yeah, yeah Madam Chairman, because you know I'm a great one for policy. Yeah, Councillor Adams. Yeah, thank I you. can do that, Chair. Actually, on your policy. Okay, Councillor Riley. Yes. I mean, the policy, Tony, when we followed a debate is pretty clear. It already exists. We've got condition 10. That's the reason why the officers are having to bring this to the committee, because under 10, it doesn't currently have the authority to do it. So the planning policy is already in place, de facto, Jody. Here, that's it. It's not the other way around. So on this one, that's it. There is the policy and it already exists. We don't have to make, we don't have to point to a new policy or a policy to actually oppose this. It's actually already um, there. We've got recommendations to okay. vary it. So yeah, can I just grounds... clarify this point, Chair? I really want to clarify this point. The recommendation in front of us, Ben, is to vary that condition 10 to allow this to take place. Is that mm. correct or not? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Um, Thank you. And that's the recommendation, what... which I'm confused about, from Councillor Wall. So the recommendation should be, the, the proposal should be from Council Ward, as I understand it to be, to vary 10 to allow that for ha to happen. And if that's the case, that's the clarity, Tony, all right? We don't need oh, any other. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and that is what, that is what Council Ward has proposed, that we yeah. should go along with the recommendation yeah. to, uh, to, to vary that condition. Uh, Officer Lincoln, did you have something? Yes, please. Um, I would just want to clarify that Condition 10 on that consent isn't a policy basis in which to refuse no, the application. So the condition um, don't, obviously don't. was... Sorry, no, I'm sorry. just thinking. If, 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 oh, sorry, I apologise. Yeah, if we're looking, if we're looking at in terms of what those refusal reasons might be, we need to direct ourselves to a policy in the development plan, which would have the re, the, that condition would have hung upon a particular um, policy in the development plan or the MPPF. Um, so. I totally understand in terms of that condition set out those particular parameters around the maximum 500 square meters at that time in relation to how that site would come forward. But what we need to satisfy ourselves is in terms of those national policies around that retail impact and offer for various other economic policies or reasons why that may not be acceptable. But we do need to refer to a development management policy or a, an MPPF policy in that respect. Thank you for clarifying that. That was point point. Okay, thank you. Well, I have to say, I disagree with what the officer is saying because she's not actually reflecting what's in the report. Okay. Oh, shut up. Okay. Okay. I think that um, 
we've we've had enough discussion in relation to this uh, application. I think that um, we need to go with. Um, it's been proposed by Councillor Ward and seconded by Councillor Fulcher that we should go with the officer's recommendation to, as stated in page 68 of our papers, to approve variation of conditions to read, to state the A1 element of the business park use shall not exceed 2,400 square metres. Is that correct, Councillor Box oh, Burgess? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I'm now going to ask Officer uh, Dawn if she could please go to the vote. Officer Matthews, if you could please go to the vote for this application. Thank you, Chairman. So if you could indicate if you're for or against the proposal, which is basically, basically the recommendation from the officer's report. So Councillor Adams. Yeah. Councillor Brennan? Against. Councillor Folger? For. Councillor Karimi Gouvanlou? For. Councillor Lorne? Against. Councillor Pratton? For. Councillor Riley? For. And Councillor Ward? For. Yeah, and that's carried with six members voting for, two against. Okay, thank you very much for your time on the application and we will um, have another five minute break. If we can please be back at uh, 12, we'll go with 12.15 and uh, we'll move on to our last application. Thank you. If you can please stop your video and mute your um, sound. Chair, I actually need to leave the meeting. Would we still be quorum? Yes, we will. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, well, thank you for your time this morning. Thank, th thank you, Chair. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll speak again soon. It wasn't quorum. I would, I would do, I would break what I'm going to do, but it's, anyway, just, thank just, you. Just wait, just two seconds. Let me just check. Um, one. I think, I think I've got six here. Yeah, and, and we've still got Nigel. Um, yeah. so okay. okay. Thanks very Thanks much, Chair. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Leah. Yes. We are still quiet, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you.
Go on, how's Rita? Yes, thank you. Yes, she's uh, been taken to hospital. Uh, suspected uh, cracked shoulder blade, but uh, we'll see how she gets on. And she's certainly going through the mill, isn't she, John? Yeah, she is, unfortunately. Mm. Send her our best wishes, won't you, please? Yes, thank you. God bless her. Okay, I think that we're pretty much good to go. Councillor Riley is unable to join us for this application. So we are still for it, so we can, we can carry on with um, things as they are. Okay, so if I can please ask Officer Matthews, if you could please do a final roll call for this morning. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Councillor Adams. Yeah, I think there are more officers now than members, uh, Chairman, but I am present. Councillor Brennan. Present. Councillor Fulger. Present. Councillor Creamy Guvenlu. Present. Councillor Lorne. Present. Councillor Pratton. Present. Councillor Ward. Present. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Seven members in attendance. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, we will now move on to application number four. 2020-0855, Land South of Green Lane East, Racky. And if uh, Officer Officer Lavica, please just confirm that we have got our public speakers in place for the presentation. Yep. I've got the nurse. Thank you. I have Paula Blythe. Thank you. And we have um, Nicole Wright, Sam Sinclair, and Kay Gibbon. Sinclair. Is that Sam Sinclair? Could you please start your? Are you able to start your video link? I have requested. So, Chairman, do one do one of the other applicant uh, agents for the applicant know if? Um... Oh, I think that, that is okay. Sam, oh, we're there. Sorry, we're there. Now. Okay, and um, that's good. We can we can start with the presentation. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Officer Burgess. Thank you, Chair. Share the screen again. So here we have an application. Oh, sorry, I just need to change some of my settings. Okay. So yeah, we have an application uh, for land south of Green Lane East in Rackheath. Um, it's a very wordy title. I will read it out, but then I'll, I'll just explain it a bit more in detail before we get on with the presentation. So it's a development of up to 157 dwellings with associated access, open spaces and infrastructure. And it's without complying with condition number three, previously imposed on the approval of reserve matters 2019-1032 and as amended uh, by 2020-1209. And this is pursuant to conditions number one and two imposed on plan of permission 2016-03-95. As I said, that's, that's quite wordy, but I'll explain that hopefully in simpler terms. So Lovell Homes secured an outline approval in 2019 and then a subsequent reserve matters application in 2020 on this site for 157 dwellings with associated access, open space and infrastructure. This application is a section 73 application seeking to amend conditions to the outline and reserve matters applications and it's trying to alter the approved house types uh, and layout, but it's layout primarily, sorry, to facilitate the delivery of 100% affordable housing with a mix of 55% affordable rent housing and 45% shared ownership. And that amounts to 86 affordable rent and 71 shared ownership dwellings, respectively. Consequential changes are therefore required to the layout to reflect the change in housing mix and updated technical details in respect of flood risk surface water drainage, energy efficiency, ecology, and landscape, and these have all been submitted. Uh, and therefore, the condition specifying the approved plans needs amending. That's the subject of this application, and that's why this application is contrary to the provisions of the development plan, which I'll, I'll work through properly in the assessment. But let's work through the slides. Let's go through the location and, and, and the uh, photograph. So here we have the site uh, outlined in red. 
to the south of the existing built-up area of Rakheath. This is the railway line running south to north, the, the Bitten line. This is the Broadland Northway, the A1270, and this is the Salhouse Road running into the main part of Rakheath, the main road into Rakheath, if you like, along with Roxham Road there to the north. Looking in more detail, this is the site specifically. Around the edge of the site, you have this um, mature tree a area in which it's proposed to be a walkway through the original application and through this one as well. With the residential properties uh, along Green Lane East, which turns into Broad Lane here. And then you've got the roundabout on the Broadland Northway and then the Salhouse Road coming in and which the access will be in approximately this location of the site. Again, this is an allocated site through GT19 of the Growth Triangle Area Action Plan. You'll see it in there and you'll see to the north there, there's a site we have an application in on the moment from Norfolk Homes for residential development as well. A site there, GT17, that is, is well on the way, if not or close to complete for another residential development there. And of course, we have the larger site, which doesn't fit fully in here, GT16 to the northern part of, of Rackheath. That's the site, just to give the very clear site boundary, so it's there for the record. And then I'll just take you through a few photographs. So this is the view looking into the site, southeast from Salhouse Road. Just make out of the frontage here, this is Salhouse Road. And I've just used the tree belt to orientate ourselves. It encloses all of the site on, on two sides. These are the dwellings over on Green Lane East. And you'll see those mature trees, not as, not as dense as the belt over here but dotted along mature trees that um, give some boundary to the site and that they would be remaining. This is the view down from what I'm going to call the Solon Hill uh, roundabout, because the Solon Hill pub is just off this photograph, Green Lane A East going down there with the, the trees I just referred to, Salash Road going back into the city, and there are the tree line there is This is the only real sort of open aspect into the site. Um, although there is, he says that, and there is a slight open aspect here. This is view from Broad Lane, Green Lane East, although there are more trees just off the plan here. That's that boundary that I've talked about, that walkway that will be retained, just an open field at the moment. Bungalows on, on this side of Broad Lane. And this is the view just from, from further back, getting closer towards the railway line. The site is actually behind this line of trees within here, and this is the eastern boundary of the site. So I'm just going to sort of flip between a couple of plans now. Um, should be able to do that fine. What we've got here is the scheme as approved. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is an approved scheme uh, for both through outline and in reserve matters and then conditions discharged as well. But just to orientate ourselves, this is Green Lane East, moving into Broad Lane. This is South House Road. This is the access into the site. And this is the walkway around the tree belt. So I want you to focus on, hopefully you can see this, this sort of area here around properties 130, 131, 129. Just for whilst I flip between the two slides now, you'll see this is the proposed layout. So I'll go back, that's what's approved. This is what's proposed. And you'll see there's the main change has been in this area that I just referred to. Um, it's been slightly amended to, to give a, a slightly improved layout and you've got more open space within this area. This area of open space has got larger as well. And that's the main, the main change. Actually, if we flip back to the last one, draw your attention to some of the garages around plots 30, 34, uh, 28. We'll see as we move down, they've either gone or, or have slightly changed in size as well. This is the proposed layout. Um, but also to show you how very similar the scheme is, look at all of this area to the south of the main road through the development, all these properties, all in here, they're in effect the same as this in this proposed new layout. And this is, this is a key plan as well. And we'll talk you through the assessment into in, in one second about the, uh, the principle of the development. But I want to show this plan because this shows you the location of the 100% shared ownership and affordable rent dwellings. So with the red dots on this plan on top of the house types, they are the affordable rent dwellings. 
with the more sort of mustard squares they're the shared ownership properties and i wanted to show you this because it shows that they are well mixed out mixed throughout the whole of the site with different sizes uh, and, and bedroom uh, sizes in particular of properties mixed well throughout it so you don't have enclaves of of one or the other type of, of development and leave you on that plan so i'm just going to talk you through the um the assessment of the scheme and the key considerations of the application are discussed in the assessment of this report on pages 82 to 94 of your agenda but i just want to draw your attention to a couple of things really and that's the principle of this development and the principle of 100 percent affordable housing now, fundamentally, as I've referred to, this is an application to amend plans and documents approved through the extant planning permission. So that's the existing planning permission. The layout of the development largely reflects the previously approved layout, as I've referred to, with the main structure of the roads and position of dwellings and open space in accordance with the reserve matters permission, which has been deemed to comply with the development plan. I've talked you through those minor changes. Um, but actually the materials are consistent with the scheme approved at Reserve Matters and the design and detailing of the dwellings also reflects the approved scheme. There are some minor alterations that may still be required from the highway and contract officers because we haven't got their full responses yet, but they've agreed in principle that this is acceptable, which is why I want to get through a recommendation. I've asked for that to be delegated, uh, but it refers to very minor things like um, the bin stores, location of bin stores, for example. And also it's needed to get a final sign off from the lead local flood authority. Um, but the plans are in effect as this approved scheme and therefore the scheme uh, is actually been accepted in principle by LFA. We just need that sign off. So actually the scheme is very similar to that approved and actually represents in, in the officer's opinion anyway, a slightly improved layout. And therefore the principle is considered to be acceptable by officers. Moving on to the 100% affordable houses. Well, on the basis that the application proposes 100% affordable housing, it's considered that the scheme conflicts with policy GT19 of the Growth Triangle Area Reaction Plan, which requires and very specifically says that there will be 33% affordable housing on this site. It didn't say above, didn't say below, it says 33%. So as I referred to in my previous two presentations, section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act requires that the application in effect is determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise and that's why the application is at committee now the delivery of 157 affordable dwellings represents a social benefit for the area which weighs significantly in officers opinion in favor of the development furthermore 33 percent of the affordable rent properties at first let would be for local residents i.e rakith residents now representations have been received and we'll hear from those today which object to this amount of um, affordable housing on the site, but on the basis that it would not result in the delivery of a mixed and inclusive development. However, whilst no market housing is proposed, I consider from an offer for perspective, sorry, that the balance of tenures in conjunction with the range of house types proposed would enable the delivery of a site which meets a range of housing needs and accommodate a sufficiently diverse section of society to conclude that the scheme would be mixed and inclusive, albeit one without market housing. I think furthermore to this, with regard to the master planning for the larger site, GT16, which identifies that the scheme may only be capable of delivering 10% affordable housing, the delivery of 157 dwellings on this site has the potential to make the wider settlement more sustainable. Um, the applicant has also stated in their planning statement that based on the existing provision of affordable housing, uh, which has been approved at 20%, the approved scheme is not considered deliverable at present. Should this allocated site not be delivered, it would impact upon the council's supply of land uh, for housing in the district. Consequently, enabling a scheme which allows this site to be developed and contribute towards housing delivery in the growth triangle is another consideration that weighs in the development's favour from an officer perspective. And then of note, finally, is the fact that if this were to be a development with a lower level of affordable housing than the 100% that's being proposed, then that would not actually preclude an affordable housing provider, a registered provider, buying all of the units post planning approval. So therefore this site or, or actually any other site in the district could have 33% of the total dwellings as affordable in the planning permission, but then the landowner or developer may actually choose to sell to a registered provider who could then deliver 100% affordable housing. And so we as the local planning authority would actually have no control over this. 
uh, and were this application not to propose changes to the layout and house types of the scheme, then this could actually have been a route that the landowner or developer uh, may have chosen to use. Actually, it's in front of us today, which I think is a real benefit because we know the layout, we know the proposed um, locations of the affordable properties. So I'll just move on to the recommendation given this presentation. And as per page 94 of the agenda, the committee is recommended to delegate authority to the director of place to approve subject to satisfactory resolution of the issues raised by the LFA, the highway authority and the contracts officer and subject to a deed of variation of the section 106 agreement from the outline application 2016-0395 and subject to the conditions on pages 94 to 96 of the agenda. So that's quite a wordy recommendation, but thank you, Chair. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Burgess. Members, do you have any questions for the officer in relation to the presentation? No. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. That will take us on to our public speaking. And if I could please ask Officer Arperton, please could you unmute Pippa Nurse? I'm trying to find. Okay, there you are. Thank you very much. Hi. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you for attending our meeting this morning. Uh, Pippa, you will have five minutes to address the committee. And unfortunately, we do not have a clock that we can share on the screen, as that would block you from our members of the committee. However, the host of the meeting will advise you when you have one minute remaining. Is that acceptable to you? That's fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. If you could please introduce yourself to the committee, and you will have five minutes from now. So I'm a community councillor, part of the Ratcliffe Community Council, so I'm, I'm on their behalf. Um, so Ratcliffe Community Council strives for Ratcliffe to remain a community spirit-led parish which is inclusive to all, remains in harmony and in balance with the current village and de um, design and layout. Predominantly, we have mixed areas of private, shared ownership and rental properties, while seeing the growth in the area. Um, the Community Council fully supports affordable rent and shared ownership options within the village, and we have supported such developments in the area. We want to see affordable housing included within all developments, in line with national and district guidelines, and disperse that there are no enclaves created. And this particular application, I'm sorry, has, um, sorry, I go back again, the enclaves um, are created, but this um, has been documented in our neighborhood plan. The development amended by Lovells and Flagship um, is made up entirely of affordable rent and ownership um, options, creating a very large enclave within our village. This goes against the ethos and our neighborhood plan, which is a legal document led by the Localism Act 2011, which we seek to uphold. Rackheath would see just under 160 properties built within the parish with no financial contribution towards any infrastructure to support these numbers. And we are currently receiving multiple submissions from an adjoining site for a further 150 houses on the same road, which fall within another parish, where again, if this were to go ahead, we would receive no funding, um, but take on the impact within the community. Um, we would potentially be hit by over 300 houses with no financial support to provide amenities, play equipment and infrastructure. We want our community to be not just for housing and wish to see it develop as it grows into an area that is sustainable, well connected and with a good range of services and amenities for residents. This development of affordable housing should not be used to offset the viability issues with GT16 and other future developments. All developments should take responsibility and ensure that affordable housing is balanced and dispersed within their site to promote inclusion and enhance our com community. We ask the planning committee takes on board the comments that we have previously submitted and we strongly stand by our objections raised. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Members, can I ask if you have any questions uh, for our public speaker? No, thank you, Pippa. Thank you for your time. It's very much appreciated. Okay, and that will now take us on to our second uh, public speaker. And it will be uh, with me, Mrs. Bly. Is that Paula? Thank you. Uh, Mayor, if you could please unmute Mrs. Bly. Thank you. <laughs> yes. uh, if I can just explain to you again, uh, we don't have a clock that we can show uh, while you're speaking. Are you happy? But, um, I'm happy. Hopefully, I've got mine down to only a couple of minutes. Okay, lovely. Um, Thank you very much. If you could just actually, 
and you, if you just introduce yes. yourself and you have I'm Paula of... Bly. I'm a resident of Ratcliffe. Okay. You may find that mine is a bit similar to Pippa. We obviously haven't got together on this. Um, the residents of Ratcliffe are resigned to development on Green Lane East, opposite Silton Hill. The, object, uh, the objection to do, do with the blend of housing, with no housing for the open market being built. The Localism, Localism Act of 2011 gave us a neighbourhood plan and the community infrastructure levy still. The Act gives local people a say in any development in their locality, which would make a difference to their lives, as of too often power is exercised by people who are not directly affected by the decisions that they are taking. The Act provides a more democratic approach to planning. The Act also requires the developers to consult local communities before submitting planning applications in order to give local people a chance to suggest changes to the proposal. Rackheath has a neighbourhood plan signed off by Broadland District Council in 2017 and this runs until 2037. With the housing for the open market, Rackheath would receive SIL money, monies which would benefit all residents. With this planning application, there is none. The previous planning application had a large proportion of open market units, whereas this one, this one should propose affordable shared equity and open market units. Other developments built in Rackheath over the last 20 years have included a blend of housing which fits in well with the existing properties. This is what we require from this development. We do hope that you'll take the concerns, which were numerous on the comments um, to do with the application of the residents of Rackheath before you actually make a final decision. That is it. Lovely. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. It's just, so sorry, I'm just saying I can't go into details like Mr. Burgess on whatever different things are, but that's just the feeling of the Rackheath residents. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Members, do you have any questions for the public speaker? No, thank you. Thank you very much for attending, Mrs. Blythe. It's, it's really appreciated. And we will now move on to our third speakers. And I've got Nicole, Sam, and Kay. Are you are you going to share your, your time or have you got a, a plan? Yes, we were um, on the basis that we understood that we have the five minutes to share between the three of us. That's right. So two of us are going to speak, Kai and I, and Sam is here to answer any additional questions that we may have for my client's level. Okay, perfect. And you're happy that we don't have a clock that we can share with you, but you will be advised whenever you have one minute. Thank you. Okay, I sound like the talking clock, don't I? That's lovely, thank you. If you could, um, whichever one of you wishes to start, please uh, start now and you have five minutes from now. Thank you. So thank you, Chairman and Committee members. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Nicole Wright and Director of Planning Consultants, Laurent Wright. I represent the applicant. My colleagues from Lovell and Flagship will join me in addressing you this morning in support of the application. You have heard from the officer that as a result of delivery challenges, the applicant has applied to vary the plans and the tenure to enable delivery in partnership with the local housing provider flagship. The scheme currently proposed will enable the delivery of 157 affordable homes through a mix of 55% of these homes for affordable rent and 45% for affordable for shared ownership. As of the 7th of August last month, the local needs data from your housing enabling team shows that there are currently 149 households on the housing register who would like to live in Rakith. Some of these have local connections. The total number on the, on the register currently is 1,399. With regard to the need for shared ownership homes, the records show that since March this year, there have been over 500 new inquiries for shared ownership schemes in Norfolk, with just under half of these being in Broadland. 
This high need for affordable rent and shared ownership homes is predicted to increase as a result of the current and future social and economic challenges that we face with impact on both the situation and lifestyles of our local community. Further pressure on the availability of housing for those who need it most urgently is also predicted to result from the growing economic impact on the, as a result of the current COVID-19 pandemic. We are all aware that not all sites that come forward for housing are able to deliver the policy requirement for affordable housing. Often there are challenges which result in significant under delivery. The partnership between Lovell and flagship homes together brings with it a great opportunity to address the shortfall. The availability of Homes England funding will secure the delivery of these homes by the end of 2023, within three years. There is no change proposed to the number of dwellings previously proposed on the site. The design changes and the change in tenure proposed bring with them a number of additional benefits, including significant employment opportunities and apprenticeships, the provision of more spacious homes of a higher standard of design in a sustainable location, to name a few. I therefore respectfully request that you approve this application to enable the delivery of these much needed homes without delay. And I shall now leave you to my colleague Kai from flagship. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. My name is Kai Gibbon. I'm the Development Project Manager for Flagship Group. Flagship Housing Group is a housing association's primary goal is to help solve the housing crisis in the east of England by providing homes for people in need. We currently own over 31,000 homes comprised of affordable and market rent, shared ownership and market sale, and have a development program of 500 homes per annum, which is expanding. Since 2006, we have developed 476 homes within Broadland, in addition to a further 1541 within the rest of Norfolk. Excluding this proposed development at Racky, we have a pipeline of 50 affordable homes, which we are delivering this financial year within Broadland, and a further 31 affordable homes in the following year. In Racky, we currently one minute remaining and manage 56 homes for rent and one for shared ownership, so it's already a location that flagship is familiar with. Data obtained from the housing team within the council identifies the current 1,399 households on the housing register seeking an affordable rented home within Broadland. Of these 1,399 households, 149 households have expressed a desire to live within Brackheath, and 10 of these households have a local connection to the parish. The council's enabling team has supported the development as it provides a good mix of dwellings and tenures, and they advise that both local and district-wide needs will be met by, because the site delivers a range of property types and sizes, as well as a third of the homes being for rent, being available for local uh, lettings. We will successfully manage this development by allocating homes in line with the Section 106 obligations, including the local resident. There will be a dedicated housing officer for the homes, with other dedicated in-house teams to manage the estates, grounds, and property maintenance. Flagship very much look forward to delivering this development and helping to meet the affordable housing need identified both locally and within the district. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Members, do you have any questions for the public speakers? Okay, Councillor Karimi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand that play equipment is normally provided through SIL monies, um, but as this is 100% affordable housing and there's no SIL levy on this development, um, would the developers consider putting in play equipment for the children of this estate? So, so if I... Th if, if, I if you could just simplify your answer as much as possible, of please. Of course. Um, the, the, the provision of play equipment was assessed as part of the original application and because of the um, attenuation tanks at, at beneath the open spaces, we're not able to put equipment on them. Okay. Okay, we can, we can come back to that discussion with uh, the officers if that's okay, Councillor Karimi. Thank you. And Councillor Brennan? Uh, 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Now, my question was going to be the same as Caroline's. OK, I think that we can bring that up with uh, the officers in, in just a few minutes. Any further questions? No? OK, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for your time, to all our public speakers. The committee will now go into discussion. And um, as I've said previously, we will have a discussion. And once we have a proposal and a seconder, then we will go to, uh, to the vote. We will have uh, Councillor Burge, uh, Officer Burgess and Officer Lincoln on hand if you need any advice. And uh, if I could uh, ask uh, uh, but Officer Burgess if you wouldn't mind addressing Councillor Brennan and Councillor Karimi's concerns. <coughs> your, certainly, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Sorry, Chair. Well, I, I was going to answer in. Um, in the principle of it but whilst we were just talking i was just trying to get the detail to to share with you as well but i'll i'll, I'll do that whilst we talk yeah cause the, i was looking for the section 106 agreement so um it's not it wouldn't be secured through sill the the play equipment it will be secured through section 106 um agreements uh, contributions <laughs> if it can't if it can't be on site then it would be contributions off site um in this instance as as Nicole has already said the principle of the scheme has already been agreed through the outline approval, which had a section 106 agreement accompanying it. Um, that had a requirement um, for a contribution towards uh, that play equipment if it was, wasn't going to be on site. So um, I just couldn't find the section 106 agreement there to find that detail of it, but that's the general makeup of what section 106 agreements would be with a cascade of on site, provision off site, or a contribution towards. Now, in my view, there is a contribution um, off-site still, uh, and I'm just seeing that the applicant is nodding. So, yeah, it would be secured, but it wouldn't be on this site. But there is a really good play ground in, in Rackheath already at Jubilee Park, where, where the, and the money would probably go towards that, I would have thought. How far away is that from the development, Ben? Um, if you... Oh, I was going to just... I was going to say, if you consider... I'll put the screen on again, because that'll be easy. Yep. Um, just one second... So what we've got here is, can we go even closer? No, we'll use this one. So this, this is the site in here. Mm. Um, and then this is that sole and heel roundabout I talked about. And then within this area here, that's Jubilee Park with the school next to it. So really it's, it is quite close to this to the site. And to access this that, you would um, be able to go along um, Broad Lane, uh, Green Lane East, Green Lane West, sorry, go up South House Road. There's a pedestrian signalised pedestrian crossing, sorry, and then there's a path that runs adjacent to the church that goes straight into that play area in there. So, you know, it's it's close, would, would be my view. It's close, but it's not mm -hmm. ideal, is it, really, oh, for oh, young oh, children? Can, can I say, I suppose, just to say one more thing as well, um, on this green, on this site here, and I'll just go into the plan, GT18, um, within that site there, uh, in the proposals that are in at the moment, um, which are, are close to being approved, in this sort of area here, uh, there is a, a park in effect there with play equipment as well, which again can be accessed via a crossing over here. No, it's not on this. <coughs> um, no, it's not on this site. I, I agree, but I think what what the applicant has said, what Nicole said, um, is a very valid point. I'll just get to the site there. There are areas in here that that actually require significant attenuation from a from a, um, a surface water perspective and that's meant it's difficult to actually provide play equipment of any you know of, of any great use i would say on the site uh, and this is my own personal opinion you might might disagree i think actually a combination uh, or accumulation of a number of bits of, of play equipment on a bigger park area is better than say you know, one or two pieces of equipment on an area that we have over here. Um, so yeah, anyway, so that that's where it would be. I think we'll have to agree to disagree there. I think a, a couple of small bits of a play equipment in the middle area, green area, would be useful for the for the children actually on that estate. Okay, Councillor Brennan, did you want to come back? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I'm fully in agreement with what Caroline is saying. Um, it seems to be that there's no reasonable attempt. It's just a case of there is a play area which is nearby. But in all honesty, are children going to come out of that development, walk up 
the Calais Road to where the Pelican Crossing is, and it is a fair distance up, to be fair, to then cross over to walk back to get to the Pay area? I think not. They're just going to try and cross the main road. So could the applicant not even just possibly make provision for at least a zebra crossing close to the roundabout to get children across more safely? Because many children are going to be going there on their own without parental care. So I suppose I'll, I'll come in there. Um, I don't think it's necessarily for the applicant to answer. Um, this application is looking at the uh, the principle of the um, change to the condition in effect uh, to secure that through offsite wouldn't necessarily be workable through this. Um, I think, you know, again, perhaps I'll, I'll go on the other way. I, I perhaps uh, uh, agree to disagree on this. Um, I think that children with parents, because that's kind of the thing we're looking at, would look to, to go along the path and go up to the, that site, to the main park, and put it, you know, primarily because the school is there as well, so they would utilise that. Um, again, it, it, perhaps looking at the principle of this application and, and that principle of the application with no play equipment on site already has, has already been approved. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, I have yeah. to say that, is that Councillor Wynnum, did you want to come back? Sorry, I've lost my screen there for some reason. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Ben, but because of this change of the development, uh, we're looking at shared ownership and low rent. Um, is it not reasonable to state that the type of occupancy would, of its very nature, be younger families? Uh, because older families without children are unlikely to be looking for occupation on this site under this proposed development. It is going to be largely families with young children. And I, I just find it very difficult for a development of that type to not have any play provision equipment where it is totally dependent on children playing in their own back gardens rather than being able to group together in a slightly larger area. Uh, it's difficult at the moment because obviously we're not in in a building where we can actually see larger scale plans but I'm struggling to see from what's been provided to us as members as to exactly what this area is uh, to which would be to the uh, the north uh, sorry the south uh, I'm get the orientation anyway the, the, the big pocket of land uh, which borders broad lane which has apparently trees um, and is that an attenuation area all of that or is that open green space so, so i'll answer that uh, yeah that's the one yeah that bit then yeah no, it's, it's primarily open space but there is attenuation area in, in this area up here as well but but then underneath um you so, know, there is, sorry yeah sorry, sorry. sorry so so what are the other three green pieces in the middle of yeah the, that one ben that one where you got yeah. your cursor on yeah, 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 sure. So, so again, they are they're open space areas, but they do have a connection to that surface water drainage scheme as well. Um, so, so, is that I, what the, the ladder shape type thing is? It runs through it. Uh, yes. Yeah, so on my my plan, there's there's a series of squares which run through <laughs> those three green spaces. Is that supposed to rep represent a ditch of some sort? Uh, so no, the, the what the what those uh, lines are? They're the contours. Of the of the site, which which oh, okay. moved down. The green, do you mean the green yeah. line? Yeah, green? On, okay. on the original planning application. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah, on the original planning application, those three pockets of land have got what looks like a ladder running through each. Mm. Yeah, they, they in effect relate to the to the um, the flow path of the attenuation. From from what I from what I understand, um, I would have to look in the detail of that. But that's why. So, so would that mean that that is open water, or is it just? No, 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 sorry, no, no, it's not open water. Right, so I we have that as got, the applicant. Yeah, yeah, so we have got actually a large amount of open space, mm. which would surely allow provision. Uh, I mean, play equipment isn't cheap, but on the grand scheme of things, something like this, it's not that expensive to provide. And, and can we not make it out as a condition that they, they do provide play equipment, bearing in mind the type of occupancy this, is, this would have if we approved it? Can yeah. I jump I in? I completely agree. Sorry, yeah. sorry. If, if we could just, uh, Officer Lincoln, if you just wanted to, to have a say. Yeah, so I guess we just, again, 
need to remember the application that we're considering. So this is a section 73 variation of condition of the consent that we have already granted. So we've granted the principle. So what we're now needing to consider is the, the changes to the scheme in front of us are the extent of what we're considering, but are there any other material considerations that have changed would, would lead us to a changed um, outcome in terms of that play space? So we've already determined that play equipment through the section 106 would be a um, contribution for offsite for various um, site constraints and reasons. Is there something in this application in terms of as a material consideration in relation to the nature or scale of those units, which would lead to the need for play equipment on site? Now, I see that you know clearly there are a number of units that are reducing scale, but in terms of the overall mix of types of properties and sizes of properties, I wouldn't say that was significantly different. Having said that, we can certainly take that away and explore that in terms of the section 106 still needs to be secured in relation to that amendment for this scheme. So that is something that we can take away as delegated to officers to explore practically whether there's a solution to deliver some equipment on site um, and or the balance between that and the contribution for the wider play space in the wider area that Ben set out. So I think if that's, um, you know, I can suggest that to you that we can take that away as officers to see what we can secure on site in the knowledge of the, of the constraints that have been set out to us today. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any any further comments that uh, anyone would like to, mm. to bring forward? Can I respond to that as applicant, please? No, I'm sorry, you can't, unfortunately. Your your time was for the, the public speaking, and um, I'm sure that the officers would, can discuss all the bits and pieces with you that um, we, we brought up at, um, in, in discussion. Could I just drop in, um, in, in in terms of the alternatives that Ben put forward? Uh, he said that there's a decent place play area on GT18. I must confess, if I was a householder on GT18 and I found that my children were being prevented from using the play equipment because the children from GT19 had come across the road, I'm not too happy about that. Wouldn't be. You, we can't put, and if we can put restrictions on anybody going over into it, a play area well no i know we can't but i'm just putting that into the conversation you know that yeah. uh, I, I i i think to suggest um, the use of the equipment on gt18 was a little bit uh, unwise can, can we add this into the conditions that we look at this the officers look at this and uh, the provision this is what I, I was just about to say i think that um from what i've heard with the um with the public speakers is that the main concern is that there isn't any financial contribution coming mm. from this side and um, and then the reduction on an, another side. So I think that this is something that we have to we have to deal with. I think that it needs the officers need to go back and they need to discuss the situation in relation to the play areas and all the other queries that uh, that come along with this. Um, I think that as as Officer Lincoln has said that we have to address the application that's in front of us. We can ask that it is a condition that the, uh, the officers should go and, and address the, the residents' concerns mm -hmm. and see if there's any way forward. But it is, it's not uncommon for, um, for you know, the, the, the Section 106 to be, uh, to be on, on another area. Um, we, you know, we, we're saying that that's a, that's a distance for, for people to walk. I have a little grand, grandchild who's, who's three years old and for me to walk from where I am to the nearest play area is a few minutes. So a few minutes, 10 minutes for her to walk up there. But, and, and I don't think it would be very much different from the site in Mackie as, as I'm aware of it, especially with the new site that's coming across. So I, I think that the walk, we need to encourage people to exercise. So I think the walk to get to the new play areas is, is, isn't unacceptable. And I think, um, you know, once we get there, I don't know what that play area is like in, in Mackey at the moment, but there's nothing to say that the section 106 can't increase what's what's in that play area at the moment. So, um, so that that's a possibility. But what I probably would like to see is the green areas. I'd like to see that there's some seating around there. I think that it would be good to see that there's a few few more trees. If if it's not possible that we can that we can be putting um, any play equipment. Um, along those lines, but it would be good to see that it's just not green space, that I'd hate to think that somebody decided that they wanted to turn it into a car park. So, um, so I think that we need to, we need to be um, addressing that side of things. 
So if, um, has anybody else got anything that they'd like to, to say before I ask if... Um... I think my, can I just send my final comment? I think it's probably more than a few minutes walk with the all due respect, Sue, and I would not like to cross the South House Road with my grandchild trying to get to a play area. No, but once you get into Rackies, I think that there already is, if, if um, Officer Burgess will remind me, I think that there already is um, a, a couple of crossings as you go through, uh, especially going up from the Solon Hill towards the towards the post office. I think that there, there well, is... I can't out. recall any. There, there, there is. It's, it's one that actually uh, working with the parish council, the local authority, um, in, in part um, secured permission for it and, and part paid for. Uh, it's a signalised crossing that goes across, as I said, to the um, access path that then goes by the side of the church that goes directly into Jubilee Park. Um, I, I have walked it. it it's five minutes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and again, I just, you know, I won't. I won't labour this point. I think it's it's worth noting though that the Section 106 agreement. I, I think we have, you know, I think we have the basis of what what members are asking. We can look at those uh, things through the provisions of the Section 106 agreement. You know, there's there's usually a, a cascade in there, um, which would be that it's on site, it's off site, or there's a contribution towards. So if members are comfortable with that, we we can work it through that Section 106 agreement. And if there is the opportunity, and the applicants are willing to put some equipment on site then then so be it we could do that i think the only point i'd raise on that is that actually we've we've had representation from the parish council who said they're getting no financial contribution through this scheme because there's no sill were the equipment to be on site they wouldn't be getting any financial contribution through the section 106 agreement to improve the play area that they've got already at jubilee park so again perhaps if we if we could have the discussion uh with the parish council as well that might be might, might be the way forward to, to go with this one i think that's most definitely the right way that the parish council will would be able to um to add to the what what their requests are but there are numerous other ways of grants um i know in thorpe and andrew that we we as a parish council we've um applied for numerous grants and under this um this development, I think that you, you would be entitled to get other grants as well, not just our Section 106. Presumably they're getting still money from GT17 and GT18, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot more development coming as well, as we know in, in Rackies, there's a lot more development coming through as well. So I think if everybody is happy, I would like to propose that we should go with the officer's recommendation. And um, if anybody would like to second that for me. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh... Okay, thank you very much. And if you can just bear with me just two seconds, I just need to, to read out. So it has been proposed by myself, Councillor Lawn, and seconded by Councillor Ward, that we should as a committee agree with the officer's recommendation to delegate to the Director of Place to approve subject to satisfactory resolution of the issues raised by the LLFA Highway Authority and Contracts Officer and subject to a deed of variation to the section 106 for the outline application 2016-0395 and subject to the conditions as stated on page 94, 95 and 96 of your papers. If we could ask please if Officer Matthews could go to the vote and uh, if you could uh, do it in alphabetical order. Thank you. Thank you Chairman. So if you could indicate if you're for or against. Councillor Adams. Um, Chairman, because I haven't heard any valid reasons why it should be uh, refused on planning grounds, I have to go for four, I'm afraid. Councillor Brennan? Reluctantly, four. Councillor Folger? Four. Councillor Karimi Gouvernou? Yeah, reluctantly, four. Councillor Lawn? Four. Councillor Pretton? With reservations, four. And Councillor Ward. Four. Chairman, that's unanimous with seven members voting for and none against, so it's carried. That's lovely. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much for your time. Members of the public, is very much appreciated. OK, um, members, we will move on to agenda item number six, and that is to receive the appeals for the... Um, at the moment on our agenda and that is if officer lincoln if you would just like to address that 
Yes, yeah, so at present and reporting in this um, agenda, we don't have any appeal decisions received. And um, we have one appeal lodged, unfortunately, apologies, I don't have the details of that. So that's a scheme for four dwellings in Reedham. But obviously, we will report on that as that progresses through the, the appeal process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And if I just, um, if we just wait, um, can we stop the the recording and the live feed, please.